Finance and Finance Standing Committee meeting uh, for Wednesday the 7th of December. And I'd like to now open the committee meeting with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. I'd like to make a special welcome to uh, our guests today. Uh, we have Jared here and also Keith Kratzman. Um, Jared's a regular. Thanks, Jared, for being with us in the gallery. And, and Keith, uh, father of former wear Wayne Kratzman. You, have you noticed Wayne up on the wall there, Keith? Uh, to your left. To your left, Keith, there's a photo of, of Wayne on the wall. So you notice that. And Keith's going to stay and join us for morning tea this morning. So thanks for being with us, Keith. Uh, wonderful to have you here. And, of course, Keith has uh, achieved a lot in his own right as a community member over the years, uh, having been the, the chief editor of the Kingaroy Herald back in uh, days gone by, and, as well as many other things that he's done in the community. So thank you for being here, Keith, and welcome. Uh, leave of absence, I don't believe we have any, so we'll move straight on. Councillor Duff, would you be so kind as to provide us with the recognition of traditional owners? Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to acknowledge country and the land where we meet this morning, the Wok Waka land and acknowledge the Elders both past, present and emerging. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Duff. Any declarations of conflict of interest? <clears throat> if you come across something throughout the meeting, feel free to let us know. Councillors, uh, 5.1 is the confirmation of the previous minutes and uh, the recommendation there can be found at page six that the minutes of the Livability Governance and Finance Standing Committee held, meeting, sorry, held on 9th of November 2022 be received and the recommendations therein be adopted. Do we have a mover? Oh, sorry, Mr. C. Mayor, Mayor, um, we've, um, uh, with, um, if I could draw Council's attention to page uh, declaration of interest on page four <coughs> of the previous minutes, um, there was, uh, we made a notation after the discussion, the um, councillors recall, the declaration came up in the middle of the debate and there was four councillors. Uh, I have um, circulated a proposed amendment to the minutes to tidy that, um, tidy that wording up. Uh, and I do apologise to council, when we put the draft out it was a little bit rough um, and uh, I have some, some advice and uh, would recommend that the minutes be moved as per uh, with that amendment in uh, item four, declaration of interest. Kimberly, can we just update that? Um, we received yeah, that the minutes with the enclosure of the Liverpool meeting uh, to, with, yes, that's correct, yeah. With the, yeah, well, with the, with, with the enclosed amendment, perhaps. Yeah, ENC. Uh, Yep, <laughs> and closed amendment. Yeah, Th thank you very much, Mr. CEO. Uh, we'll now seek a mover on the on the um, motion as presented. Councillor Erkin uh, seconded. Councillor Potter. Speakers to the vote. Those in favour, carried unanimously. Thank you all. Council, we have one uh, committee. We have one late agenda item, which everyone should have a copy of. It's item uh, L one, and it relates to a notice of motion for dog registration. So. We'd normally deal with notices of motion at this point in the meeting, so we'll go to that item now, uh, if we could, Mr. CEO. We'll need a procedural. Thanks, Mr. CEO. So I'll move a procedural motion that to item L.1, notice of motion dog registrations uh, be dealt with as the next item on the agenda. I'll move that. Do we have a second? Councillor Duff, thank you. Uh, go to the vote. Those in favour? Okay, that's been carried unanimously. All right, uh, Councillor Duff, to your notice of motion. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. The motion is that Council revisit the dog registration. The committee recommends to Council that Council revisit the dog registration fee applying to dogs in rural residential areas. I'd like to move that motion. Thank you, Councillor. Do we have a second? Councillor Erkins, thank you. Okay, now we'll go to speakers. Councillor Duff, first of all. Just remind uh, Councillors too that our new standing committee Orders of uh, our standing committee um, policy applies from today. So um, we're able to have open and free discussion prior to moving a motion. In this case, the motion's been moved. Every councillor has five minutes to speak. 
and then an opportunity to speak a second time for a further two minutes. Uh, the speaker gets that privilege as well as the opportunity, the mover, sorry, gets that privilege as well as the opportunity for a right of reply, so they'll get a third go. Uh, over to you. Thanks, Councillor Duff. Thank you, Mr Mayor. The rationale that I've put as the, through um, the procedure as the notice of motion is that it used to be $10 per dog and now it has changed to $33 per dog. The community feedback that I'm getting is that we did not do any community consultation and we've just put that fee on. So when we've got um, people who are struggling and uh, running tight budgets and people who are um, you know, living in um, caravans in our parks for, without homes and all sorts of things, and we just and a lot of times these dogs are their companion dogs and but in this instance is we're talking about rural residential areas and we've just whacked it up from ten dollars to thirty three dollars and I just think in hindsight and hindsight's always a good thing that we should have done consultation before we went ahead and, and tripled more than tripled what the current price was. So that's the um, reason why I think it needs to be brought back to the table. We need to revisit it and look at um, perhaps leaving it at the $10 and then doing some consultation around raising it up to that sort of figure and maybe even doing it in increments. If we are going to land at 33 it shouldn't have been done from 10 to $33. So just hoping I get the support of the Chamber. Thank you. Okay. Councillor Potter. Um, I agree with Councillor Duff. Don't be surprised, but I do. Hey, Councillor Potter. First speakers. Councillor Erkins. Um, it's, it's not just the um, $10 for just a normal dissex dog. There are other, there were, I think it was the fact that we um, took away the, dis, the different prices between dogs that are in the defined area in town and those that were on rural residential blocks. So they were the ones that saw the big hike in their prices. So I think we need to revisit the fact that if you're on rural residential, that's where the prices um, actually went up, I believe. Thank you, councillors. Councillor Jones. Yeah, thanks, Mr Mayor. So just um, some clarity, Councillor Duff, you're asking for this to come back and just be re revisited as far as discussing the uh, fees and charges for our budgetary discussion. So that's all you're asking today. We're not having a, a further conversation. It's just you want it brought back. So the fees and charges at this stage will stay at that level or are you expecting something to be some sort of guidance given today to, to change? Because we can't make those decisions in these sort of meetings. So, um, yeah, just some clarity, Mr Mayor, and then I could, I've got another follow-up question. Yes. So, Councillor Duff, would it be in your intention that this be revisited as so the current, obviously, renewal notices have been issued um, for the current financial year, I understand, of the current year? Um, so it would be your intention that we revisit this item specifically focusing on this with a special report be brought back as part of setting the fees and charges for next financial year? Would that be your intention? Uh, through you, Mr Mayor, I'm thinking that it's caused such a concern at the moment that we probably should put it on hold until we revisit it because, yeah, I just... this, this Look, I've had people phoning me. There's, you, there's been massive amount of Facebook posts and, uh, and around, the town, around the town in Nanango, they've just gone, yeah, it's really caused some reputational damage for council. So I just seek the um, views of the chamber as to how we should manage it. But I'm just concerned about our reputation, about the push, the, you know, the pushback we've had with this and, and a way forward, whether we put it on hold right now and revisit it or... Sorry, I can't answer your question specifically. I just wanted to bring it to the t attention of the Chamber that we've got issues around this particular matter. So just happy to get guidance from um, other other councillors as to how we could manage it or whether we should, could put it on hold or what what we can do to to mitigate the, the damage, the fallout, the reputational damage that we have currently happening right as we speak. Thank you. So I'll just come back to Councillor Jones shortly, but just so everyone is clear, yeah, the renewal notices have gone out. Um, they've been sent out, so every dog owner would have received that. Some would have paid theirs. I imagine there's a due date set on those now that's probably coming up in the weeks to come. Um, so that's pretty well locked in, I would have thought. Um, it may be a matter of what we, how we actually communicate to the community if we're intending to revisit. 
perhaps we get some media out to say that we're going to reassess the dog registrations into the future in relation to the cost of the, of the service to council. Maybe you'd like a report to come back as to how we could reconsider that and maybe communicate that perhaps. But I don't know, council, there's an opportunity to do anything about it now. The renewal houses have definitely gone out. Mr CEO. Sorry, I don't mean to interrupt the councillors, but just also um, one of the things, and, and we've received quite a significant, and I would uh, take the opportunity to acknowledge the front counter staff. They've worn the brunt of this um, quite unfairly. Uh, it's people like myself and ourselves here that make these decisions, and I would request that um, the community show some respect on occasions. Some of the people that have come in uh, have been quite abusive and never tolerated, not, not accepted. Uh, but also just uh, one of the things that we are finding, and I can't give you the exact numbers and certainly if we're revisiting it, I'd like to know myself, is because the rural residential was the $10 mark, there was never a pensioner discount allocated to them because their fee was less than the pensioner fee. My limited understanding of how the computer works is that uh, in this, if you tick the pensioner box, they would go to the higher fee. So a pensioner in a rural res is $16.50, not 33 so a whole dog is 50%, not the whole fee. And a number of the ones that have come in and they've started off um, quite angry throughout the counter, they've actually been able to be resolved, I won't say easily, but they've been resolved because they've been given the lesser fee. So you've gone from six, $10 to $16.50. So there is part of it is um, certainly, uh, if you're a pensioner and you're in these rural areas and you have your dog, bring your card in because we don't necessarily have you on the system. Good information. Thank you, Mr. CEO. We'll stay with Councillor Jones. Yeah, so I'm, ha I'm happy to revisit the discussion, but as it's just been discussed there and highlighted by the CEO that, and Mr. Mayor yourself, that uh, things have been sent out and probably some people have paid. So it's difficult to do anything now. I think we just need to roll with it. And as far as um, making decisions, and I'll just use the um, wheelie bin rollout right now, we're getting the same thing back. We were elected to make decisions. I won't go too too long and I'll keep the, my comments for a later date, but same thing, we were elected to make tough decisions. We've done that and uh, we could see the benefit in it financially and for sustainability going forward. And I just, again, fair and uh, equitable across the region. So I'm just, I'm happy to support uh, bringing it back to the table at the, at the um, budgetary discussions for next year. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Henshaw. Yeah, thank you, Mr Mayor, through you. Yes, I had one phone call in relation to that, a quite irate lady uh, in relation to the fees. I actually, she explained to me she was a pensioner. I did explain to her that she was entitled to a 50% rebate. With that, she was much more happier than she was previously. So perhaps we portray that a little better or further um, in, in some media release. Um, but as Councillor Jones and Councillor Duff, I'm happy to revisit that. Um, in the budget discussions for next year. Thanks, Mr Mayor. Councillor Erkins. I'm concerned about leaving it as it is because I know that there are a lot of people who are struggling but not necessarily on a pension, so they don't get any rebate um, on, that, on that fee. And there, a lot of those are the ones who are living in that non uh, in the rural residential area um, to leave it as it is now we're coming into Christmas people have got all these extra fees to pay so if nothing else I would like for them to be given longer to be able to pay their fee because I think and what what is being discussed on Facebook is that people are just not going to register their dogs so really where are we where are we winning I don't think we're losing if people are not going to register, and if people can't afford to register, what are they going to do? So I would, you know, I'd prefer to give more time for people to be able to do that. But when we say revisit it, I would really like to um, revisit a lot earlier than our budget for next year because they've got to pay it for this year, and this is a year that they're doing it tough. As I said, not everyone is on a pension, so I would like to see that differentiate, we differentiate between people on rural residential and people in town because that's where the big increase has gone. Councillor Schumacher. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, it's my understanding that every fee and charge that council 
actually sets is reviewed annually as part of our budget deliberation. So this, this fee, along with every other fee or charge that Council has set, will be revisited as part of the budget discussion. So I, I actually don't see um, this motion, and certainly with the information provided here, there's, there's really not the rationale that I would need to assess this fee. Um, and I just wanted to talk to that general manager, um, Omay. I remember as part of the budget deliberations, there was an extensive amount of information provided to councillors. I did actually go looking um, for it, but I've since moved house, so I couldn't find it. Um, an extensive amount of information for councillors around the operational costs of running our dog management services and the fact that we we're seeing an increase in community expectations and needs around uh, dangerous dog complaints, around meeting um, the needs of compliance um, in terms of people actually being able, having an officer employed, being able to respond when somebody had an issue in a community. We also had, and if I remember correctly, the costs of the RSPCA to actually run that pound service for council had increased quite significantly over the time. And we were certainly not receiving the funds back from um, the number of dogs that were impounded to run that service. So like every fee that council sets, every charge that council sets, I certainly understand there's always a community impact. And I think that's why we're all very passionate about ensuring that pensioner discount of 50% was retained, but we also recognise that spreading the costs out to the rural residential owners actually meant that we wouldn't have to increase the costs for the urban people to the extent that would cover those, cover those shortfalls, because that's all I saw through the budget process, was shortfalls in running this service. So General Manager O'May, really with the rationale here, there's, there's not enough information. I'm wondering if that information that was discussed can be recirculated and, and perhaps we need to come together as a council team and just make sure that we're all across the information that was provided um, to council during those budget deliberations because it was some time ago. Yeah, yeah, so we, we can definitely recirculate the reports that were presented to Council um, back during the, the, the discussions. Um, yes, it, it, and the discussions were around providing equity between those rural residential and the, and the urban uh, populations. When we looked at the, um, the, the, the registration fees don't pay for the compliance service, so it's in rough figures, it's probably about a quarter of the um, cost of running the compliance unit. Um, would be recouped through the registration fees, um, and we did look at the fees in a in a bulk. Like it's it's difficult to pull out one section and and just amend those fees because it, it, it is looked at. So the, um, the the rationale was trying to make equity b b between those two groups. Uh, the the urban residents have had a zero percent increase. There's been no changes to the to the registration fees in there. So this year. Um, so it's only been it, that rural residential is the one where it has been impacted, um, and so those ones are just coming up in, in um, closer to the. It wasn't sort of full. I think the entire dogs were about half what the uh, you pay in, in town are. So yeah, so it's difficult to just pick one fee without impacting the the, the rest of the fees. And yes, they have all been um, um, sent out. They have it extended. They have got an extended time to pay. So the re renewals aren't due until the twentieth of. Of January, so I think we had a seven-week, um, about that seven-week payment um, opportunity for residents. But yeah, we can certainly bring back the information, but that was all put through those those budget um, meetings and, and figures for sure. Yeah, thank thank you for the clarity. I, I certainly I recognise it's a very difficult time for everybody in our community at the moment, and I do empathise, and I do certainly recognise how important it is from a mental health point of view. I know how much joy my dog brings me every day. I just, I know that this decision was a difficult decision because, and I do remember it clearly, the amount of information that we went through and it was really around the fact to be able to deliver these services for the people of our community, we have to be trying to recoup some of the money somewhere. Um, 
I, I certainly, as part of our budget discussions, am very happy to review every fee and charge um, that, kept, that council sets. If we've got it wrong, we absolutely need to amend it. Um, so I'm supportive of the motion and supportive of further discussions through this, this year's budget committee meeting discussions. Councillor Henshaw. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Just quickly, I have the, the statistics and the figures on that that was prepared by a our staff that we deliberated long and hard on, and I'll just bring to attention that out of all those categories, there were several categories that actually went down. Um, defined entire went from 170 down to $131, and defined D6 went from $66 down to $33. So there's a little bit of a trade-off there as well. And I guess the bottom line is Council's trying to encourage responsible ownership of their pets. Thank you, Mr. Further speakers? Councillor Erkins. Um, could I just... Um just check that. That went down for people living in town, but it actually raised quite considerably for those living on small acreage. So the small acreage people are the ones that I am most concerned about. They're the ones who had the huge price increase, and it was a huge price increase. I appreciate that they've been given extra to pay up until the 20th of December, but for a lot of people, that's then coming to school, but coming back to school you know, it's a, it's a bad time for an extra fee to be coming out and I just need to express the fact that I believe we need to make a decision and the decision needs to be that those people that are on small acreage, their dogs are nowhere near the work for those in town. They will, they're the ones that are most likely harder to police, whether they register or not, so you've got those who want to comply with rules and regulations will pay and will struggle to pay. However, you're going to have a huge percentage who will not pay that registration, so they will not register their dogs at all. So I don't see how that is going to help our budget at all. And maybe the fact that we pay so much money to um, the RSPCA for managing our pound, that's one of the things that needs to be revisited because that's a huge expense that I just don't really see the cost bearing out. Councillor Jones. Yeah, thanks. Just quickly, Mr Mayor. Look, in, in regards to Councillor Erkins' comments, people are doing that now. They're not, they're not registering their dogs and they're easy to police and all that. Rural residential still, and I, I just want to clarify something in what Councillor Shoemaker said in regards to um, the rural residential and the residential. When I made the decision, it wasn't about trying to get money or whatever it was. It was about trying to be fair. Now, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, General Manager, that the fees have gone up and the, the fees come down, as Councillor Henson said, to 131.50 for an entire dog. We are still only charging the res rural residential people half of that fee for this year, and I am sure that in those conversations when we made this decision, we said that we would come back and review this before we put it up to the full fees. That's, that's my recollection of all this. And you can say whatever you want, rural residential small acreage. Dogs on those small acreages still have the same potential, same potential to travel and cause the same amount of grief as dogs in a residential area. All I'm doing, the reasons behind my way that I voted in favour of this is the fact to bring it into line, and I just think it's fair and equitable. And as I always say, I try and make decisions to be fair to everybody in the whole region. And I just think that this brings in the line. They are still not paying the full amount of what a residential person is. And I, I'm sure, I am sure that in that conversation when we that we spoke about just previously, the long conversations, we said we would come back and revisit this anyway before we put it up to the full price, knowing the impact that it would have. And Council Shoemaker alluded to the costs and everything else. I would like to see the figures on how many times we get called out to rural residential dog issues. That's something I'd like to see as well compared to the, the residential. So I'll just leave it at that. I'm done, Mr Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Schumacher. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. Uh, just possibly a request through um, CO Mark or GMO May. I think there's a lot of information. We did go through a lot of information and we really haven't shared possibly that story very well. I think, is there a communication strategy and plan in, in place around um, 
the issuing of these notices. I know I did see that a media release went out to say that they were being issued, but in terms of the change in fees, how did we actually notify people of that? Did we write them a letter with their notice? Did we, what, what have we done? Yeah, through you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, so that so that's probably a cop that as to failing in this. We haven't advised people, so people have got their renewal, and that, and that's when they're advised of the change. So there was no specific media around the change in those fees, similar to the other eight hundred fees that we set through our fees and charges. But um, yeah, so we um, yeah that that's probably where we could put some more media around it. But yeah, um, and it, as um, Councillor Jones said, yeah, it was it was the intention to scale them in, so they they weren't taken to the full full price. It was to 50 percent or roughly fifty percent increase that this first year, and then look at it again for next year, um, whether to, to bring them up equitable to the to the urban ones. CEO Mark, do you think there is an opportunity here to um, to actually communicate some of the information that council considered in making this decision, uh, rather than just saying that we've Release the fee. I think, I think that is a failing on our part. To be honest, I think we really do. If we make decisions, we need to explain the reasons why and be clear in that. And I know that this was a very difficult decision. Every fee in charge is. And um, I just think, CEO Mark, do you have any suggestions around how we may be able to better communicate this to the community? The reasons why the fees have changed. Excuse me. Thanks, Councillor. Yeah, um, I've just out of even today's discussion, made a, a note to we'll get we'll get some um, further communication out, Mayor, and uh, media release. And the the bin one is interesting because there has been quite a significant number of information about the bin's rollout and the little leaflet went out with the bin um, compared to the dog. So it may be something sim similar. Uh, whether we can target a, a direct mail drop to the rural res, and again, I'm, I'm shooting off the hip without knowing how. Difficult that will be, but certainly uh, more more communication, more media. Yeah. Yeah, thank Great. you. Hi, Councillor Potter. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, through you, Mr Mayor, is it possible, um, Councillor Jones mentioned it before with regards to a question on notice. I'm just wondering whether we can have a question on notice with regards to the differences between rural res and residential for dog compliance um, and CRMs, if that's all right? And a report to be brought back to a future council meeting. Thank you. General Major, I Yeah, we, we can certainly look at what we can um, um, bring back. It's certainly in, in the number, number wise, yeah, we'd have to interrogate the data. It's not something that we could easily um, pull out because we'd have to yeah, line the mapping up with the CRMs. Um, and then, yeah, and they, and they are often, yeah, depending on where the areas are but we can have a look and see what we can bring back thank you okay general manager uh councillor Erkins, i think you have had your two opportunities to speak uh general manager omay councillor duff having heard the debate um kimberly would you consider um just a, a slight change to your motion as follows to give some clarity to the staff particularly the council revisit the dog registration fee fee applying to dogs in rural residential areas through the provision of a special report encompassing Comparative fee data, comma, cost of service, and an appropriate community consultation and communication strategy at the March 2023 Standing Committee meeting. And, and because this has been a, a change, I'll give everyone another opportunity to speak to this, I think, Mr. CEO, would be fair, wouldn't it, for councillors? Yeah. Councillor Duff and Councillor Erkins, I'll go to you for your thoughts on that in terms of clarifying it. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, I'm happy with it, except that I think that March is too late because 
we've got the issue now. Um, I guess my intention was that we could then communicate, if we're going to go out to the community now, we could certainly explain to the community the reasoning behind um, the price increases through a communication strategy right now. And in that, we could also advise that council will be um, considering dog registration fees as part of our process in March next year. I'm happy with that because I think that um, particularly around the pensioners, like they need to know that, it, that they can apply and get that 50% discount on it and, yeah, all sorts of um, reasons that we can make it, like show that we've actually tr listened to the community. That strategy, yeah, if, we, if we do that now and then we go back and revisit it in March, I'm happy with that. Thank you. So Mr CEO certainly taken notes that he'll work with our comms team to get a media, some information out to the community about the reasoning behind the decision that Council took some months ago. Um, and in that we could incorporate, if Council's happy to do so, an indication that as part of our budget process, we will be revisiting the dog registration fees in March next year. Um, so I think I'll hope, if you're happy, Councillor Erkins, are you comfortable with that? Well, how about we go back around the room again? We might give everyone another opportunity to speak. Does anyone want to comment on, on that, Councillor uh, Erkins? Yeah. Um, I, can, I can remember the debate that we had at the time, and I know that it was a fairly heated um, debate, and Councillor Jones just reminded me that those on acreage for an entire dog were actually getting half, they were actually only paying $68, and that was probably a miss, um, a mistake on my part. I was thinking they were paying the 131, and I remember we did we did debate to get that um, fairly heavily. So I'm, I'm fairly happy with this, and I, and I have to say, I'm also probably comfortable with the decisions that we did, that we did make, except it still has affected our community. I'm concerned about that. Thank you, Councillor. And just to point, um, Councillor Erkins did, I think, mention the 20th of December as the payment two days. Just to clarify for the community, it is the 20th of January. So Council has given an extended period of time yeah, for the payment of that. Yeah. Thank you. Councillor Schumacher. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr Mayor. Fully happy to review. Um, I think the suggestions you've added are very much what I was thinking. We really do need to look at the cost of the service. Um, I know we have already done some comparatives with other regions and we actually sit quite well, but I'm happy to review that data again. And I also just think the story, we often make decisions, but we're not, and I know this is an operational challenge of ours. We don't, we are un, very um, unfortunate in the sense that unlike our fellow neighbouring councils who are much larger, who have fully resourced media and communication teams to talk with their community, we do not. And that's our biggest challenge. That's why people, you, I, these seven councillors here, this is why our phones ring, why we get so many emails, why we're constantly challenged about things in the street, because we, we do not have the resources to tell the story and we don't tell the story well enough. I'm very comfortable with the decision. It was a very difficult decision. It was not an easily made decision. It was something that we had discussed and discussed and discussed and discussed. And I know for a fact I went through every general ledger for this department, their operational general ledger with a red pen, and we clawed, tried so hard to claw dollars out. The reality is there are no dollars to claw out. The reality is this is a core service that the community's safety, if we're going to have... 32,500 people, well, almost 33,000 people now living in the South Burnett. We need to be looking after core services like the management of animals in our region. And dogs is a big part of that. So I, I really do want to see us get better at sharing the story, sharing the information, because we know we have the conversations, but often out in the community that's not known. You know, and I think one of our biggest challenges is the fact that people don't understand where their rate funds are actually going and that only a fourth, a quarter of what we're raising through dog registrations is actually helping to cover the costs of animal management in our region. There is so much information that we need to share that's not known in our community and I think this is a, this is a prime example of another instance of misinformation 
where we haven't been ahead of the game, where we haven't been telling the pe people of our region, the people we represent, the story. And unfortunately, we've all been once again beaten over the head over a decision that I'm actually quite comfortable in making. Further speakers, Councillor Henshin. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Shoemaker. The facts are there um, and a huge amount of work. We did have a lot of deliberation and debate on this. 17 categories in our, in our dog registrations. There's 5,882 dogs out there that are registered and the, and the responsible people doing that. Seven of those categories went up, two went down and eight didn't change at all. So there's some interesting facts and figures there across the board. And my little white, blue, pink and yellow state it and you know my passion about dogs and animals. Um, of course, it's a tough debate, but across the board, I think the council made at the time a responsible decision, but very happy to go back and review this. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Further speakers? Councillor Duff to close. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I um, think that we, um, I'm happy with the changes that you've made. I think that we need to listen to our community. I'm concerned about the feedback, the pushback we're getting around this. I think that um, it, when the community sends a strong message to us that we need to listen, and perhaps as, as Councillor Erkins has suggested, if the, if the fees are too high, after a while people just give up and they won't even register their dogs. So I think that we do need to revisit it, and we also need to, um, as has been said, to get the communication strategy right. And But even before we do make these decisions, we need to consult with the community it's it's a big um, it's a big challenge to get the message out there, but I think that um, the more the more we can consult with the community, the less pushback we're going to get when we get make decisions like this. So happy with the motion. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. That uh, now closes the debate. Let's go to the vote. Those in favour, carry unanimously. Thank you all. Okay, uh, we're up to item six point one, and. Uh, I'd like to now uh, present uh, as read my report and uh, in relation to corporate governance, strategy, people and culture, communications, finance and sustainability, ICT and business, community representation and advocacy and 2032 Olympics and Paralympics portfolio report. Um, in doing so, I would like to acknowledge uh, the work undertaken by the corporate services team, the people and culture team, the executive services and communications staff, and the finance staff. Thank you very much for your work throughout the course of the last month. It has been a very, very busy time for these people who work behind the scenes in keeping the operations of council ticking over. So thank you very much for that. Uh, the information is quite detailed and provided in the report. And as such, I'd like to now uh, move that the report be uh, received. Do we have a uh, seconder? Councillor Potter, thank you. Any speakers? Councillor Schumacher. Um, thank you, Mr Mayor. Just a question um, to yourself or question on notice. Something that I've been watching closely is um, certainly the Olympics and there's some real excitement, but there's also some real concern around what the Olympics will actually mean for the South East Corner and being that we are two hours from Brisbane, um, you know, I think there are giant opportunities for our region to um, lever leverage some of the outcomes, um, potential outcomes of the Olympics. Uh, I've been watching, I know there are many mayors, many councils working in this space, and I understand there are some exciting opportunities. Um, I was just wondering um, where you're at, where your vision is, how you're planning to um, attack the advocacy point of that, um, if there are opportunities um, for our region, what, what we're sort of doing to act on them because, you know, it's a very exciting time. There'll be an enormous... I was watching a, um, a webinar that I logged into. Um, there'll be some an enormous population they're predicting being displaced by the Olympics um, that will be looking for areas like ours to live in. Uh, so I know housing's going to be an issue. They're talking about water being an issue. You know, there's some big challenges there. I'm really curious what you're doing in that space. Certainly, Councillor, thank you. And um, pursuant to the announcement that uh, Brisbane had won the, uh, the Olympics, uh, thanks to much of the hard work done by Brisbane City Council and the government and other uh, 
councils that were involved in that process. Um, there has been a process commenced now. Uh, so I have been uh, in Gaia. I've had one meeting um, with uh, an organisation of uh, representatives across the Wide Bay where we're looking to work to get together collaboratively on a strategy for uh, the Wide Bay LGAs in relation to um, preparing ourselves and getting on the front foot in relation to uh, making the most economically and socially from the opportunity that the Olympics certainly provides. Uh, I'm just not sure when the next meeting is, but I've certainly had one meeting on that, looking forward to another one, and state development are certainly heavily involved in that as well. Um, there was much discussion, I've, I've also had these discussions um, with the Premier, on Thursday when I was in Brisbane, I had afternoon tea with the Premier and made it very uh, clear to her that our council is very keen to be um, actively involved in the process with the Olympics. Um, it may not necessarily mean that we actually get any training facilities here or any training opportunities, but certainly in terms of the opportunities in relation to uh, visitation and tourism um, would be where I think we are most likely to see significant benefits. Um, so. That process is certainly very much in early days, but uh, there is a framework in place through the Wide Bay um, Olympics uh, Strategy Development Group um, and certainly um, very keen to continue discussions with government around that. But I think it would be primarily driven by the Wide Bay group as such and then that will then go up to government in terms of opportunities for us up here. Um, one of the things that I've really encouraged the other Wide Bay mayors to come on board with in terms of um, our regional strategy is to consider the fact that we do have three major international tourist destinations here with the Great Barrier, the, uh, the Southern Great Barrier Reef, uh, Fraser Island and the Bunya Mountains and, and encouraging them to see that as a package, a promotional package for people who are international tourists that might like to travel throughout the Wide Bay region um, with us being, of course, on, on the on the western side of that. Um, so, so there is certainly work happening. Um, what I would certainly like to do in the new year is bring a report back to, to a committee meeting in relation to how that framework is working, how the framework works, what's happening with the Wide Bay uh, strategy development plan, um, and, and I guess seek feedback from council as to how you'd like to see us move forward in that space. What opportunities would you like to pursue and how would you like to see that happen? Because you're very right. I mean, this is certainly going to happen quickly and the strategy and the plan needs to happen now. Um, and, and, you know, it's certainly put, it's put South East Queensland in the international spotlight. And so the benefits around particularly tourism aren't going to happen in 2032. They're going to happen in the years leading up to it because it's going to promote international visitation as people want to come out and... and um, and experience what we have to offer. So I think it really has probably helped to put us out there and, and put us on the map for one of the better term internationally through the promotion of the Olympics. So the expectation is that we will see a, a trail of visitors uh, internationally come into the region uh, well before 2032 in the lead up to the Olympics. So yeah, very much strategy is very important around that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. I think um, also I've just had some conversations with different producers in the region, you know, how we have that conversation from a Wide Bay Burnett around um, providing the food, the produce, the wine, gracing some of those tables. I know there will be enormous number of, of events and very mindful of the opportunities to collaborate with Sherberg as well next door in terms of Indigenous tourism for our region and sharing that story. So I really look forward to what you bring back and, um, yeah, providing input into that Wide Bay framework. Thank you, Councillor. Further speakers? No, okay. Go to the vote, those in favour? Carried unanimously, thank you all. Okay, 6.2, Workforce Plan, 22 to 25 at 32. Thank you, Mr CEO, if you wouldn't mind. Thanks, Mayor. So, um, uh, through an inquiry from the Mayor as well, and we've also had it in the operational plan, this is... Um, development of the draft workforce plan. Um, as the report notice, we've um, held the staff survey back to uh, the beginning of the new year. Uh, and we're also adding into it the employee, employee value proposition. This is, we'd set a target date for the operational plan of having the first draft of the strategy. And this is literally the first draft. So it hasn't been through any corporate process. It hasn't gained any feedback yet. Uh, hasn't been checked for typos, so it is literally hold hop the press of the first draft. So our target date was 31st December for getting the first draft out. It's received, uh, putting put out now for information, will be circulated for uh, full adoption prior to the end of the financial year and certainly feedback mayor on it. Uh, it's a 
it's a good step to consolidating some uh, quite old documentation we had in this space and uh, some of the questions we get asked by yourself and other councillors is it's always good to take pause and breathe and think about what you actually do and the multi-skilling aspects and things and we do a lot of that but we don't document it on occasions. Um, so yeah, so this is um, part of the journey of to um, getting, uh, well, a recognition on uh, formal recognition of the framework we operate in and also uh, seeking any suggestions, feedback, any assistance is graciously received and would be welcome. So yes, Mayor, happy to take questions but it is literally a first cut uh, and hit our target date of having the draft ready by the end of this calendar year. Thank you very much, Mr CEO. Um, we might go to the motion that the committee receive the draft workforce plan 2225 for information. Do we have a mover? Councillor Potter, thank you. Second, Councillor Henshin. Uh, speakers, Councillor Potter, no. Further speakers, Councillor Shoemaker. Um, thank you, Mr Mayor. I certainly have had a look at the draft. I think it's a, it's a great start. Um, I have got quite a bit of feedback here. Um, I did have a question just in relation to the staff survey issued in early 23. I see staff will be questioned on what it means to have a job at SBRC. Um, and of course, that's going to inform your employee values proposition. Um, I'm wondering what currently happens, what discussions currently happen around um, our values and certainly in terms of culture. and. What I, I would like to see in that survey is we take a measure of the culture. Um, I would like to see us have a, a, some strategy sessions, and I'm not sure if you do this, CEO Mark, but with your executive leadership team and certainly the um, um, management team um, to, to define how we perceive the culture now, um, certainly discuss what we would like it to look like unpack what it currently feels like and what um, what we would like, what it currently feels like and what our stretch or our measure would be to, um, I guess, consider what that culture should be. So I'm wondering what work you're doing um, with your executive leadership team and your management team. I know this is a draft plan and I know it's quite a, um, quite a, Good document to start with, but I'm I'm more interested about the conversations and the richness of those conversations, and how they're actually really informing the outcomes on the ground. Thanks, Councillor. Um, yeah, uh, we've done a lot more this year than we have in in previous years, and, and what's the old joke? In our spare time, we do <laughs> we do the operational. Um, Matters take a uh, fair, fair, fair component of the day. We have um, okay culture. We'll go back to values and culture. So probably did more in the so after the adoption of the corporate plan, uh, we did more in the uh, value proposition space and the the organisational culture. And it was um, at the beginning of this calendar year. Uh, it's it's interesting to revisit where we've been over the last twelve months. Um, and I want to I'm deliberately is not the right word, but put quite um, aggressive looking backdrops with colour and, and certainly when the staff turned on, came back to work in January, it had the new, um, it had the new values uh, out of the corporate plan. Feedback we got out of that was just tremendous and then there was several people designing new ones and trying to change them and People read them for a change and the Achieve had been on there for three years and I could have wandered around and, yeah, bar those that were original, um, what did it mean and why was it there? And simple, so so that's the simple and then we've ended up and we'll revisit these again in the new year and swap them over, same values but just swap them over. Uh, at both ELT and SLT, so we changed the language this year. We've, we've, we've done quite a bit, the strategies, the org review, the, the strategy sessions and discussions that went into that. Um, reintroduced and I've got a, another rollout in my head for this next year uh, as far as the next stage of this, but we've also introduced the value proposition to all the, the uh, executive meetings and it does the soul good to go back and actually look and the the ones we get wrong or, or we, we miss or there's issues associated to often get the airplay. But you can go back now through 12 months worth of, um, of well, we you, 
um, it's possible to go back to 12 months and just see through for the management group as to where there's been a demonstration of staff uh, adhering to or excelling the values. There's been a demonstration of cross departmental teamwork. There's been a demonstration of, of good things that we've done. We've got 12 months of just, and people sit around. It's not pre-prepared, it's at the meeting. It's okay, who's got a value proposition? Yeah, so so that's the first stage, and then the um, the feedback section, the EDRs, the employment. So there's all the the standard tools, the employment development reviews. There's um, some of these have we've been chiseling away at a couple of years, refining them, and, and always always improvement that can be made. So there's been a lot of work going into this for this space. So the staff survey will be based on the previous one. Um, the uh, draft of the questions, which were pretty similar to the one that the first one the disorganisation did um, 18 months ago, uh, as it would be now. We want to um, bring in and start again re-engaging, well not re-engaging, but having that discussion about what is the employee value proposition, because the employee, employee value proposition, we've got uh, an understanding of our metrics and we certainly do have uh, uh, some wonderful staff, but we also have, um, I'll risking getting my statistics wrong, so I won't give you a number. But we have a significant number of staff that have, have we've seen through the the employee recognition um, days and awards over the years. Uh, whilst that's back now dwindling back a little bit because we've caught up with all the numbers, we've had a significant number of staff of over 20 years service. Now the new generation that's coming through, there's cultural differences between those those generational age groups. Not bad, but just they're just different. And that employee value proposition is such an important aspect, not only to, to long-serving staff, but that new generation coming through, it is part of part of the understanding of how they think. So yeah, so I'm not sure, Councillor, if I've been given my five minutes, if I've answered your question fully, but uh, a lot of work being done and the staff survey and the employee value proposition and having the workplace plan done by 30 June next year, uh, I think will give us a, a build on good good solid framework or good solid foundation and continue to scaffold up. Yeah, thank you. Um, certainly I think the workforce plan is a great tool that could help us forecast for the budget ahead. Um, I think it's a, it's a, it's a good start. Um, I just, I would like to see, um, or I'd, I'd like to have a conversation certainly with uh, you and the management team about this. I'm very, very mindful that culture eats strategy. Um, I did review the survey results from the last survey and I think some of the questions, um, I would like to see a few more questions about culture and how people feel about their day-to-day -day jobs and, and what it really does feel like and what they would like to see it feel like. Um, I'd also like to see us really spend some time considering what budget and how we empower our staff to t teach them the skills they need to lead people, um, what training we offer people to go from management positions to leadership positions. I think there's a mammoth amount of work that needs to be done in this space. I'm really grateful that you've started a journey. I know it was a long time with maybe not enough work done in this space, but I am very passionate. You know, we have 300 people relying on us today for their families' paychecks and wages, more than 300 people. We have 300 people delivering services to our community today and quite often I've sat in that office and some of the feedback I'm hearing from the community in the way in which we treat our people is, is not great. And I, I, really, I really do think we need to, to take the time, to make the time. This needs to be our highest priority for the year ahead. Thinking about our people, putting them first, thinking about how we provide what they need to be successful because I think if we get that right, the conversations that I hear in that customer service centre here will change. And um, I, I do have a, a long list of feedback here that I am going to email you, CEO Mark, but I would like to have some conversations as a council with ELT about this. Mayor, if I may, um, yeah, if you could CC uh, Manager People Culture in too, please, that'd be that'd be brilliant. As I said, all feedback, welcome. And without one sounding like here's one we prepared earlier, so another thing that we've done this year is we've just finished to six days, we pulled 20 staff out from day-to-day -day operations. 
a mixture of managers all the way down into coordinator foreman, uh, leadership training workshops, uh, adult learning process, active listening, learning zones, accountability managers, leading versus managing personalities in the workplace, self-awareness, discovering values in team, testing assumptions, managing conflict, understanding, diagnosing culture, organising values and culture, managing change, building blocks, stages of team development, performance management, capability management, delegation, time management, uh, threat versus reward, and, and personal act, down to personal action plans. And it is um, a significant investment, but it's a, it's a wondrous investment in the future of not only that individual, but for this organisation. And it's the first of many in this space to come. Thank you, Mr. CEO. And just in terms of um, Council's observations about how we treat our employees, I'd certainly like to acknowledge the work that you've done with um, our general managers and our people and culture team. I think our, um, what, from what I've observed, we have a, an executive leadership team who are very focused on the promotion, development and wellbeing of their staff. And I think infrastructure, for example, where we've seen our trainees and our graduates being brought through, um, I've been very buoyed by the work that's been done by the executive leadership team. And I know you are all very focused on the, on the development and the well-being of your employees. So thank you very much, General Manager Meehan and Omay and Jarvis for the work that you do with our staff. I think overall our staff feel appreciated um, for the work that they do by us as a council, certainly not always by the community, sadly. Um, and that's something that has a long history in council. But uh, thank you, Mr. CEO, for your leadership in this space. I know you've made significant progress since you've come on board. Um, before we go to Councillor Potter, I just would like to make a couple of comments. Firstly, um, I really like in this document the overarching 1.1 item that talks about good performance and practices are recognised and reward, rewarded, having a mechanism why, whereby that can happen on, systematically. Um, I really like 1.4 that, that goes to uh, having a focus on individuals' own aspirations and training and development. So everyone within the organisation feel as though that they are individually, uh, have their own training and development plan, that they are recognised as an individual um, with opportunities provided through that planning. Uh, 2.4, I really love the attract, and attract a diverse and talented candidate pool. And I, I know Mr CEO is conscious of the work. We need to do more work in attracting people living with disability and, and employing people living with disability, employing uh, and retaining uh, our First Nations people um, we still have work to do in that space, but we're certainly making improvements there. And our traineeship program has been successful and we're now moving into the school-based field into the future as well. Um, and the final item for me, 3.1, um, which is about leadership engagement and staff training and the focus there on multi-skilling. And I know we've had this issue with the waste, uh, with the water team, the importance of training up our engineers so that they can multi-skill across technical areas um, through a program of... Um, I think they call it the Defence Forces um, Redundancy Management or something like that, Mr CEO. And we have got um, Lieutenant Colonel, former Lieutenant Colonel uh, Friday coming in from the Defence Forces, our local fellow Steve Reynolds, and he's offered to speak with councillors about the strategies that they used in the Defence Force when they're out on a ship thousands of miles from anywhere to, uh, to back up, you know, to have multi-skilled staff so that if someone goes down, the ship doesn't stop. Um, things keep working. So that's going to be an interesting discussion on Friday from which I'm sure we can take some valuable information and share with our people and culture team. Yeah, so thank you, Mr CEO. But I think this is a really great start. Thank you for bringing it forward. Uh, Councillor Potter, your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Just a couple of things. Like, it's, I, um, you know, reading through this, it's really good to see that there's 75% of the staff um, have engaged with regards to that survey. And I think um, that pretty well shows that they're all, most of them are engaging. Um, the other thing is that it's good to see that we're also on target for the staff, um, with the staff safety performance. And also, um, I'd like to note that it's really wonderful to see that the South Manit Regional Council has come on board with regards to domestic violence and the mental health that they're doing within that space. So I know a number of staff members have done domestic violence workshops now and also the mental health first aid. And that's not just um, internal, that's the external staff as well. And it's wonderful to see. And thank you very much for, um, for, for UCO, Mark, and GMMA for, for helping that 
sort of go ahead in that space. Um, actually, and I think all the GMs, because they've all got staff members that have done some of those particular courses. And also, just particular with 4.2, um, it's, um, it's really good to see that the that the council is actually evolving with the needs of the modern day workforce. And that's really, really important in now and day and age because as CEO Mark said, staff now usually only, instead of you know years ago you'd be in a job for the rest of your life, staff actually do change, tend to change. And if we can actually work with that and if they do want change, it can be changed within, within the council so we then keep that um, valuable information that they've learned with us. Thank you. Further speakers? No, okay. Uh, all right. Well, um, I'd probably just like to add one more comment, my second chop, if I can just say to the community, um, you know, we go out and have these on-site meetings with community members. Please understand, community, that the staff enact the decisions that we make in this council chamber. And that applies from the CEO right down to the entire organisation. They are the operational arm of the organisation and the actions and the work done by our staff uh, in accordance with the budgets that we set, with the priorities that we set, uh, with the directions that we give through our resolutions to our CEO and executive leadership team. I think all too often um, we see staff approached out in the community by members of the community when they're trying to get their work done. And if anyone is out there listening, that's why you have a councillor. That's why you have an elected representative. If you have issues or concerns about things or see opportunities, please approach your councillor. Please try to avoid uh, confronting our staff because they are simply doing the work that we ask them to do. And uh, the decisions that are taken by council, we as a collective have to be responsible to, for those. We are responsible for those and we answer to the community. Um, so I think, you know, council should make a sort of inferred, there is work to be done in that space in terms of ensuring that we uh, are engaging with our community, they're engaging with us and allowing the staff to get on with the work that they're employed to do. So would appreciate that message uh, getting through the community as well. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, let's close this one off. Uh, we'll go to the vote. Those in favour? Carry unanimously. Thank you all. That concludes section six. Um, committee, I'd probably like to now move that we break for morning tea early today. Uh, we've got Mr Kratzman here. Um, I think he's going to join us as well, Gerald. So I'll move a motion that we adjourn for morning tea. Do we have a uh, um, seconder? Councillor Henshin's already got it. He's all over it. Thank you. Uh, those in favour, carry unanimously. Thank you all. Unanimously. Thank you all. Move on to item 7.1, meeting dates for ordinary meetings of councils, standing committee meetings, general meetings and budget meetings. That's at 53 on the agenda uh, where we have the recommendation there as presented on page 53, with a schedule of meeting dates on pages 53 to 55. Do we have a mover for the recommendation? Councillor Potter, second Councillor Henshin. Speakers? No speakers. To the vote, those in favour? Carried unanimously. Thank you all. Thank you, Mr CEO, for bringing that forward. 7.2, notice to repeal separate regional council resolution 2020-168 at 56. Uh, Mr CEO, would you mind providing us with an introduction on that one. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor, and just getting the PDF to work up. Okay, thanks, Mayor. So uh, with the establishment of the standing committees and the terms of reference, uh, the change of names and just updating the terms of reference, there is the old terms of reference, and this is um, called a procedural motion, but this is um, to uh, remove the previous terms of reference prior to the new ones being adopted. Thank you, Mr. CEO. We have the recommendation there, therefore, that the committee recommends to council that, in accordance with section 262 of the Local Government Regulation 2012, the following resolution be repealed. Resolution 2020 168, item 8.9 of the general meeting held on 14 October 2020, establishment of council standing committees and terms of reference. Do we have a mover? Councillor Shoemaker, seconded Councillor Potter. Let's go to the vote. Those in favour? Carried unanimously. Thank you all. 7.3, adoption of the Council Portable and Attractive Items Policy, Strategic 032. It's at 71. Uh, thank you, General Manager. Introduction. Happy for us to go straight to it. 
straight to it. Okay, we have a recommendation there at 71 committee uh, as follows. The committee recommended council that the South Bend Regional Council portable and attractive items policy strategic 032 be adopted as presented. Do we have a mover? Yes, Councillor Potter, second to Councillor Henshin. Speakers, to the vote, those in favour, carry unanimously. Thank you very much to the team for putting that forward. Uh, we'll go forward on to 7.4, adoption of the counts of Council's infrastructure, environment and compliance, standing committee terms of reference, statutory 0 06676. Thank you, Mr. CEO. Thanks, man. So this is uh, you know, just sorry. going electronic. Um, in preparing uh, the draft of the sustainability policy is um, encourage me to ditch the paper agenda again. Um, the this, this is the standing uh, the turn of reference to follow up the previous resolutions as far as um, the change of name and the um, number of standing committees. So it's it's I could say pretty stock standard. But there was some discussion, uh, Mayor, which we haven't added in, and as this resolution can be adopted as presented, but uh, for discussion today, in the rotation of the chair, of the because council appoints the chair of the committee um, via resolution when it appoints the committee. With this week's, if there was an appetite for council to rotate the chair of the standing committee, so each council, so two standing committee, three month rotation, each council would have a term of rotating a, uh, a standing committee over the period of time. Um, if these terms of references go through, and if that's that's a, a, a well, I'd say a will of council, uh, we can bring the um, I can bring the uh, original resolution that established the two committees and the appointment of the chair, and we can just amend the appointment of chair. So that would be the mechanism. The term of reference today is uh, an opportunity to discuss: is that something council wishes to pursue, or are you just happy with the mayor chairing all the standing committees, or in his absence, deputy mayor, and then? Uh, elected from the members as uh, through basically normal procedure uh, or is there any interest and if there is interest we'll bring the report back to the ordinary meeting next week. Yeah, thank you Mr CEO. It's something that I, um, a notion that I proposed uh, to Mr CEO a little while back in relation to um, giving councillors the opportunity to consider whether that we would like to have a rotating chair uh, to enable councillors, in both in terms of one's professional development, but also in terms of the opportunity to, um, I suppose, um, uh, you know, in engage in the process of, of uh, leading the meetings. And I know in some councils, Toowoomba, for example, um, they have rotating chairs where portfolio holders chair the committee meetings and the mayor chairs the ordinary meetings. So it's certainly not, um, it, it certainly not is new territory for councillors to do such. But I think, Mr. Ceo, as you said, we really just wanted to get some feedback from council as to what your thoughts are around that. So I think in a lot of that, happy to open it to, a, have, let's have an open and free discussion around uh, your thoughts. So we'll go out to the floor. What, what does everyone think? Councillor Potter. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Look, I think this is a great opportunity for us um, as a council um, to progress us. But I also, this is the way we use, like, previous term, we actually used to chair our own portfolio meetings as well. So, um, and I do miss that type of thing. So it would be really great. And I think for all councillors to have that opportunity to actually have a go at chairing the standings. Thank you very much. And thank you for bringing that forward, Mr. Mayor. That's wonderful. Thank you, Councillor. Okay, further speakers, other others, thoughts? Can you hear everyone's thoughts? Councillor Duff? Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor, I agree with uh, Councillor Potter. I think it, it would be um, really good if the councillors um, could chair the meetings as um, we, as Councillor Potter said, we used to do that and it was really um, good. It gave everyone a chance to um, be up the, up the top table and um, it also, and you're getting more um, out of being the chair, like the leader of your portfolio because you're up the front there and, and you're, you're the one that's um, technically meant to be right across that, so it just um, it's a good opportunity as um, to for um, personal development, but also so that you you're um, following through with your leadership in the in the actual portfolio itself. So I'm really keen to see it happen. Thank you. And, and certainly, exec services, but yeah, we try and line up the portfolios as, as best we can. But keep in mind that there's a t there's a two there's a, there's a three monthly cycle, so it may not always you know work perfectly. But it's really about giving every opportunity to, to uh, take on that lead, you know meeting leadership role. Yeah. Um, okay. Others thoughts. Thumbs up. Thumbs down. Councillor Shoemaker. 
Yes, I, I don't really mind either way or not. It was something that we did discuss early in the term. Um, I think it's a great uh, growth opportunity for individual councillors um, to, to be able to, you know, in terms of polishing up on your meeting um, etiquette, I think it's always a, a good thing. Um, so, yeah, I don't, I don't mind either way. Mr Mayor, um, very mindful that uh, of the Mayor's position as, as the Chair and I do, um, yeah, I, I don't have any concerns either which way. Nothing further? Okay. Well, Mr C, I think you've probably got a fairly good understanding of it. You, you Thank, thanks, Mayor, and through, you, through, through your Mayor. So we've got the, the meeting date report, the terms, so as I said, there's no, need, there's no changes to the terms of reference from today, I reckon, Mum. So we'll um, bring back, a, and I've made a note to um, resolve to bring a report on rotational chair for standing committees to the December ordinary. So we'll fold that in and bring all those reports and they can all be dealt with in sequence and, and um, we can add it in then with the resolutions. Thanks, Mayor. Mr. CEO, so we'd take the recommendation as presented then. Yeah, thank you. So the recommendation there is that committee recommends to council at the South Pennant Regional Council, infrastructure, environment and compliance standing committee terms of reference. Statutory 066 be adopted as presented. Do we have a mover? Councillor Duff, secondly, Councillor Potter. Further speakers to the vote? Those in favour? Carried unanimously. Thank you all. Okay, we're now up to the next one, which is the... Uh, adoption of Council's Livability, Governance and Finance Standing Committee Terms of Reference, Statutory 067. It's at 82. It's pretty well the same discussion, Mr CEO, with a thought, yeah. So we'll go straight to the recommendation at 82 um, and I'll just get that where it's uh, proposed. That the Committee recommends to Council that the South Bend Regional Council Livability, Governance and Finance Standing Committee Terms of Reference, Statutory 067, be adopted as presented. Do we have a mover? Councillor Henshin, seconded Councillor Potter. Speakers, to the vote, those in favour? Carried unanimously, thank you all. 7.6, adoption of the South Bend Regional Council Arts, Culture and Heritage Advisory Committee, terms of reference, statutory 045 at 88. Recommendation is that committee recommends to council that the South Bend Regional Council Arts, Culture and Heritage Advisory Committee, terms of reference, statutory 046 B, is it 046, 045, is it? Bureau 045, um, be adopted as presented. Do we have a mover? Councillor Potter, second to Councillor Henshin. Speakers, Councillor Potter. Yeah, thank you, Mr Mayor. I just want to point out a couple of things within this policy. So Nananga Theatre Company has officially been added, even though they are have been members. And the other thing that's been added there, which for some reason got missed during one of our meetings, is that um, this group will now assess the, the Regional Arts Development Fund application in accordance with Council's Community Grants Policy. So which is really good that that's now formalised into, into this terms of reference. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you, Councillor. Further speakers? To the vote, those in favour? Carried unanimously, thank you all. 7.7, .7, uh, adoption of Council's Community Grants Program Policy. It's strategic 005, it's at 95. Recommendation is that the committee recommends to Council that the South Bend Regional Council Community Grants Program Policy, strategic 005, be adopted as presented. Do we have a mover? Yes, Councillor Henshin, second to Councillor Potter. Speakers? Yep, Councillor Duff, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. I just thought, like some just some explanations around some of the ch changes because I just noticed in the discretionary fund all of those points about um, what the discretionary fund was could be spent on had been de deleted and there's just different changes. I'd just be interested to get a, some feedback from the general managers just why some of these changes have been put in place. Okay, thank you, Councillor. So if we go to page 97 onwards, I think the first round of changes are at 98 on the agenda. Thank you, General Manager. Yeah, three, three Mr. Mayor. Yeah, so essentially, like, so the changes of discretionary funding is really just clarification, just that they have been re put in, but it's just lining them up with the, with the regulation. So it really hasn't changed the intent of that discretionary funding. Other, other, um, through other minor changes for the policy is, is just reflecting the previous policy council just adopted that RETF grants application that just clarifying that that assessment will be done through that committee. Um, and just a couple of others like the school sports awards and I think the hall insurance, just so we'll open them up year, year, 
long rather than through the rounds. So those couple we had, like the hall insurance, were coming through the through the rounds, and you get some committees might miss that. So we'll just so we'll accept those applications um, as as they come in through through the the year. So that was the school student awards and, and the hall insurance. We do have other things like the Indigenous fund, the, the sports. Um, Categories that they are open year round as we get applications. So essentially, your um, the rounds will be just for those pure commu community grants and ev events. So all of the other um, sort of I suppose uh, minor categories can be just um, distributed uh, um, as submitted throughout the year. Um, so it's, yeah, so I think that's probably the um, the, the summary of the changes. Mm, thank you, General Major. We'll stay with <laughs> Councillor Duff. Um, it's actually, you've crossed out the community hall insurance will be open throughout the financial year. That's actually deleted by the way it, the way it reads. Or is it just... So is it, that just highlighted? That's just highlighted, is it? And then you, yeah, okay. So the, the other question is, there's been um, some concern about the ANZAC Day and the Australia Day. So have we addressed that in this policy? Because I know that some people think that they just... Some community groups think it's it's something they just apply for separately to this, or is it part of this? No, through you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, no, it is covered under this. It and and it was one of those categories that we did actually open up to year round applications rather than in the rounds because you get you did get groups that were actually missed out on the rounds and then realised oh um, those those things are coming up. So they are. Um, if I can find them. On, um, yeah, they must be one of the first things, aren't they? Page 101. Yep. Page 101. So, so no, they're open through throughout the year. What was your question? Oh, yeah. oh. Councillor Atkins. Thank you. Um, prior to submission of an application, this is in the council of discretion requirements, is that actually highlighted that they must contact the relevant councillor on page 699? Yeah, through, yeah, through you. So, so the yellow is the changes, so, so that's why it's just highlighted. But that, yeah, so that's, um, yeah, with the discretionary funding right there, it's just recommended people to talk to the councillor. Yeah, I, I've just found that um, organisations are contacting direct council and you know, you don't know anything about it, and I feel it's a little, um, you know, I feel it's just good manners that they contact you first. Thank you, Councillor. Further speakers? No? Happy to go to the vote? Mr... Uh, Councillor Jones, sorry. Yeah, thanks, Mr Mayor. Sorry about that. I actually want to endorse what Councillor Erkin said because I've, I don't know about the other councillors, but I've actually had stuff come through to me, unbeknownst to me, saying or requesting the whole lot of us put, like haven't been approached to buy a phone call or anything to say, have you, are you interested or would you support us? Just all of a sudden, whoever they've talked or spoken to, it just comes through and then are you willing to put $200 of your discretionary funds in here? And then you end up in a position where you're nearly obligated because if you don't support it, whatever's going on. So I, in the future, I'm just going to refuse those uh, simply on the on the point of principle because each individual councillor, if, if there's something in black butt, that somebody, a group down there, wants $200 from every councillor, I think it's only right, and I tell the people, to make sure you contact all the other councillors and ask them the same question you've asked me. So I'm just putting it out there that if I get that come back to me from another region or another area that I haven't been contacted by phone, just on principle, I'll say no to it. So that's I think we need to address that somehow. Yeah. Councillor yeah. Polly? Yeah, just to clarify. So when when we had the meeting with um, with with Brad and the manager of livability, um, we went through quite a few things, and this is the one thing with the the other councillors had all said to me that it, it's really getting quite um, it's really getting quite annoying that they're getting all these applications that they have no idea about. So that was then added in. So hopefully people will read that and before they put the applications in and actually contact each and every one of the councillors before. So that was put in there because you all complained to me about it. So, yes, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Potter. <laughs> <laughs> OK, first speakers, go to the vote. Those in favour, carry unanimously. Thank you all.
7.8, adoption of council's property leasing policy. It's at 103. Recommendation is that the committee recommends to council the South Bernard Regional Council property leasing policy. Strategic 030 be adopted as presented. Do we have a mover? Councillor Henshin, seconder. Councillor Potter, thank you. Speakers? Okay. Uh, General Manager, through you to your team, uh, information to provide in relation to uh, changes in the policy. Thank you. Yeah, through you, Mr. Mayor. So, so this is a new new policy. So um, basically, just setting that policy head of power for the um, for the property leases that we, that we enter into. Yeah, just just setting out some um, some principles. Um, yeah, definition. So yeah, it really is just to to provide that policy framework, which because we are entering into a number of, of property leases, um, and that. So yeah, it, it's just a, a um, yeah, two-page policy, brand new one, just to, um, for council information. Thank you, General Manager. Further speakers to the vote. Those in favour, carry unanimously. Thank you all. Seven point nine, procurement policy at one hundred and six. Okay, sorry, one hundred and eight. Watery eyes. Um, so, committee. Uh, committee recommends to council that the South Bernard Regional Council procurement policy, strategy, uh, sorry, statutory 007 be presented, um, as presented, be considered. Uh, do we have a mover? Yep, Councillor Potter, seconded Councillor Henshin. Okay, uh, General Manager, did you want to give us um, any insights in relation to changes to the procurement policy? Thank you. <coughs> sorry. Through you, Mr. Mayor, um, I'll, if you don't, uh, through you, I might hand over to uh, Manager Anderson. Um, in my absence, um, uh, there was a, a committee formed to review this policy, uh, this policy and uh, this policy reflects the input. But um, it's also a legislative requirement that we adopt it annually, but um, I think maybe with the direction of CEO Mark that this may... Um, be presented at the January, uh, is this the council meeting? Oh, thanks, Mayor. Just to answer the question, I was going to, when I had a opportunity, so um, why the slightly different wording would be that generally councillors like to have a really good look at this one, so we're not going to push it through for December meeting and it'll come back to the January ordinary. So you've got uh, any, any time to digest it or ask questions, it would come back to ordinary. So it's tabled today for information discussion, any feedback today. Uh, if not, then it, it'll uh, come back to the January ordinary. CEO, thank you for the extra time to consider such. Um, Manager Anderson, uh, any significant changes about with, uh, that you'd like to bring to the attention of the committee? Thank you. Uh, yes, through you, Mr Mayor. Um, I'll bring your attention, um, some of the main changes or major changes um, that were made um, through this um, review was surrounding the purchasing threshold table and just adjusting some of the dollar values and um, days for quotation. Um, so basically, um, we've changed or proposed to change the um, first tier from um, $2,000 up to $5,000, which is then requiring only the one quote. Um, the theory behind this is that there's a large percentage um, of our spending is under that $5,000 and because most of that is low risk um, and when we're looking at things like goods, you know, if you, if you go into a shop and you're, you're seeing if they, those goods are there, you know, you're getting your quote right then and there and, you know, you'll be able to say, well, do they have that in stock? Yes, no, okay, well, we need it, we don't need it, you know, go from that. Um, yeah, so that, that was sort of one of the major changes in um, the policy. Um, we've taken out some of the old, um, like, LG tender box and things like that that now don't exist to get rid of them out of the purchasing threshold table. Um, and other than that, um, Louise um, had spent a little bit of time. There are a couple of little clauses in there that were in there, but council didn't, um, I guess... We, because of the resourcing and our capabilities, we didn't actually do those sorts of things. So things like doing the vi um, financial viability, sustainability on contractors, we don't actually do that. We don't have the capability to find out um, 
you know, their financials and things like that. Um, so we've removed that at this point in time in the evaluation criteria. Thank you, Manager. Councillors, Councillor Duff. Through you, Mr Mayor, just a, qu a question. When I was on the, well, councillors were on the bus tour with, um, and Manager Searle was in the, up the front and talking, and I asked him about the flood damage and about um, we had the contracting, contracted it out to Red Frost and, not, and I didn't know we'd contracted to Red Frost. And I'm, I might be have misheard, but he said that what I believe he said was that when you go through local buy, it doesn't have to, it doesn't go through our procurement policy. That so because it's outside the policy, and I just wanted to um, to want to number one flag that because I just think that councils need to be able to, to be across the fact that we've engaged Red Frost. Or you know, I just think that that should be included in the local, in our procurement policy, the local buy. If it's not, so that was my question and my thoughts. Yeah, thank you, Councillor. So just to clarify, that the policy um, requires that in excess of two hundred thousand, I believe, uh, come to council. Local buy. Does it provide an exception to that, General Manager? Thank you. Oh, oh, oh sorry. sorry. I'll yep, you, yep. Mr. Mayor. Oh, sorry. I'll Thanks, Jean. Legislative. And then I'll yeah, the thanks, GM. Yeah, cheers. Um, there's an exemption under the local government act for local buy. There, um, they um, are a pre-qualified. They're a supplier that um, that uh, we can use because all of the, um, as per the act, they've done all of the uh, research and people registered on there um, have already been checked by local buy. So it is a um, an exemption under the Act that we can go directly to local buy, but I'll just give you, uh, General Manager, uh, me in. Oh, yeah, through you, Mr Mayor. Um, we, so if we apply that, we apply that with the left-hand side of that column there. So if you can see on page, Kerry will bring it up for me. Uh, page 117, so where you've got the left-hand side there, that's your local government arrangement. So that's our panels and local buys panels. So it's applied in the same methodology. The only difference between local buyers, local guys, uh, is a state uh, local guy. Local buy um, is a statewide panel, so all the councils have access to those panels. So, for our case, we wouldn't have enough supplies to create our own engineering services panel. So, we use the um, we use the local buy panel. So, if yeah, sorry, council Duff, we'll stay with you. Uh, so, so then my question is: Is it is can this be part of our policy that? Anything that's through the local buy is has to be brought back to council so that we know that you've engaged someone um, rather than using. I mean, I know that you're saying that it's a state government and it's all, but the, how do we know that there could be some a local contractor could actually do that? And you've just gone outside that. Just is is there any way that that can actually be put through that it has to be through council so that we are across what we're actually doing? Because there's they're the mass big contracts, and I didn't even know we were engaging those people. Does he add to add anything to? I was going to say, Councillor, and I'm happy. I just haven't got it in front of me, but we did actually, in the flood update, referenced Red Frost in a council report. So it's it's come through council as far as informing council. The local by uh, Peak Services LGAQ. Um, the local buy panels are extremely valuable to us and, and we do utilise them on a, on a basis. So uh, generally, in, well, I say generally, certainly in the red frost and the flood damage, um, I think, I'm just trying to think which report it was in, but it was in the flood update report and, and happy to circulate that again if, if that would be of assistance. But um, I wouldn't, it's a legislative exemption that's available to us, Mayor, and I'd just be... I would just be very cautious of, of doing anything that might uh, impact that because as when, when we need to use it, it, it does give us a lawful exemption to, um, and I think General Manager Meehan and Jarvis both said as well, they've actually gone through all the procurement and the tender processes, otherwise they can't be on that panel. But if it's an information thing, yeah, absolutely. And uh, the Red Frost examples, we, we made sure that was in a report. I'll dig up the report and I'll circulate it, Mayor. It's this is enshrined in legislation, Mr. CEO. If council was of the appetite, as Councillor Duff, I think, is suggesting, um, to to, to um, 
instil in this policy a requirement for those recommendations on local buy purchases to come through council for final approval. Um, are we able to actually do that if it's already covered by legislation? Yeah. That's, yeah, that's a, and that's, I would be very hesitant to answer that question without getting some advice. Um, but um, I, my point, I suppose, is where I'm going, if it's an information reporter who will be engaged in local, uh, through, through a local buy panel, um, that's easy enough to do. Um, but yeah, it could take it as a question and come back, ma'am. Well, if you don't mind, yeah, general manager. Yeah, yeah, me. yeah, I was just going to make a comment because we've got a situation this week where we've been um, served um, an appeal, so we've needed to engage solicitors to to represent council. We've got a deadline um, to meet to to serve those to respond to that um, court papers. If we were had to bring that engagement back to council, then we so that's where we access like the the local by panel of providers. Um, so yeah, we w wouldn't have the opportunity to engage them under that that panel. So so there is some, as as the CEO has said, there are some circumstances where we do need to access that panel at, at a sort of short notice. So yeah, I've just got that situation I'm working through today. So um. we'll stay with Councillor Dove. So, so uh, she missed me, but we I mean we we have at Wednesday meetings, we have livability, we have committee meetings, we have um, general meetings. Surely, within that week time frame, that that could come back through through council. Like, I'm just surprised that that they would have to make on the run kind of decisions when you're talking about big ticket items that, that they could that we couldn't know about it. I just I'm just frustrated about it. I just think I'm not saying that we didn't find out about the red frost, but I we found out that we'd engaged red frost, but I didn't know what the process was that we just suddenly had red frost. So that's what I'm frustrated about. So, so Council, uh, Councillor, are you suggesting that we should consider uh, whether we can actually legally do it, but consider that approvals, final approval or final endorsement of a nomination of a contract or tender from the local by panel should, should be made by Council, which would have to go through an ordinary meeting um, to have, uh, to hack, yeah, delegations would only apply to an ordinary meeting, that, that, so that would be once a month. Yeah, is, is that what you uh, I'm where you want to go with this? In some way, shape, or form, that I think we need to know when these decisions are being made and the background and all of that. Whether it's whether if we whether we even if we don't make the decision, that the, that it's it's a requirement that this council knows that that decision has been made, not just ad hoc that we 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 gauge red frost, but the process and, and that we actually did that or the, the one that um, General Manager O'Mays just flagged, we wouldn't even know about that. And we're councillors and we get this second hand, third hand and I'm just... So I'm keen to hear, to know what, what is allowable, but whatever is allowable I'd like to see it in this policy. Okay, we, we certainly would need to take that on notice and give to see Mr CEO an opportunity to get some legal advice so we can do that. Uh, Councillor Shoemaker. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, certainly understand the comments made. I guess uh, I would also want to know from a council point of view, like some of those decisions are quite operational in nature, I imagine. So I guess I'd just be concerned about where councillors as the board are set to make decisions about the strategy and the, the policy. Some of those things I think I think we could... I think we would have to just be very mindful about um, our role as councillors and, and at what point is that operational decision or an actual strategic decision. So I'm uh, happy for more information to come back on that. I do have some questions about the policy. Um, the first one is on page... Sorry, I've got them all here. So on page 117... Just to confirm, there's no more LG tender box. So is that is is that just a, no longer a service that's offered that we've removed, or uh, yes, uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, I believe they have changed names or been taken over. That's why they them in their own right aren't available anymore. Um, 
can't remember um, which one it is, so I apologise. Do we do, do we pay a membership or anything to that, or is that just a free service that was run by somebody else? I was just mindful. Um, I might have to take that one on notice. I'm just not sure about the, um, some of those um, marketplaces and things like that as to which ones we have to pay for and which ones we don't. Cool. Um, question on page 116, just some clarity. I, did, I didn't quite understand. I was reading it late and I've read it a couple of times here. So the last paragraph that you've changed, council recognises the need to impose minimum quotation time frames when seeking requests from suppliers however it's a, it seemed to be a bit vague um however the purchase of goods is considered routine or leverage both being low risk whereas the procurement of services is considered high risk and complex i, I just didn't really understand what that actually meant in practice yeah yes no um through you mr mayor so this one here is essentially around if you need to purchase a good from a store, they either have it or they don't. So going into a store and then needing to say, go out for quotation for 21 days, realistically um, is a bit of an operational inefficiency because they might have it now in 21 days, it could be gone. So that's why um, we have put that paragraph in around that mainly those quotation timeframes will be around um, actual services, not goods, because go into a shop, they'll say, yes, they've got it. No, they don't. So if you get your three quotes from three stores to say, yes, they've got it and this is the price, well, you don't really need to then have to wait 15 to 21 days I before see. you can say, yeah, I'll buy it from here. Okay, thank you for that clarity. Um, just on page 119, um, there was, I've got here, for offers to be considered conforming, an offer must. So this was around... It was a little bit, I, I didn't really understand what we meant and was seeking some clarity, particularly in that last point there, council may but is not bound to consider or accept a non-conforming tender. Any non-conforming offer may be clarified or may be rejected and the non-conforming offer is not evaluated any further at the sole discretion of the evaluation committee with advice from the probity advisor. I just wanted to know what that looked like in practice because I know sometimes there are local um, suppliers. There's also a point here that says, you know, to be a conforming tender, it has to include all documents and information required. And I know from some of the local businesses I've spoken to, they've said sometimes that's too onerous. They've got too many projects on at one time to provide all that information. It's quite difficult. So just wanting to know... A, how do you make that decision around whether you accept that or not? A bit more clarity. Yeah, through Miss Mayor, I can give an example for this one because most of these seem to end up in ours. So the idea of the non-conforming, so the council is not bound to consider a non-conforming or it can consider a non-conforming. So there's two ways we apply that. If we go out and we say we want a concrete bridge and you come in and give us an alternative design that we may not have asked for, we can consider that. So you might, so we're, uh, which has happened quite a few times where we've had people submit a tender and they've said um, treatment plans for a classic example, reservoirs and those sort of things. You've asked for this, but we can give you A, B and C. As a group, we can look at whether we wish to accept that offer or consider that in our in our tender. The other one with the non-conforming is that exactly what you say, you've got some, and some of our, I acknowledge some of our documents can be quite complex, but they're there for different reasons. Um, and some of our contracts, um, can be a little bit ambiguous in their scale up, so they can be quite heavy and depending on the nature and the risk of the work. So what that allows us to do is to look at what has not been accepted um, and as a committee, we can decide whether we accept or have a further discussion with that person um, if they're missing documents. So if you leave a document out, you might not be non-conforming, but it mightn't be a, a showstopper if that makes sense, is where we might have another one where people are non-conforming because they failed to hand over their financial details around their security and those sort of things. That is a, So we look at the, what the risk of the missing non-conforming element is, if that makes sense. So, mm -hmm. um, And we've done that a few times in the past where, particularly as you say, a local has left something out, either they've misunderstood or they've accident, it allows us to go back and say, we'll accept your tender, but we wish you to provide those documents to us. So when we make that decision, we make a decision and we have a, a plan in behind that. Um, if we've chosen to accept, every time we go back to a tender, it is recorded. 
Um, and also if we've asked for something that is um, different to every other tender, then we may choose to consider going back to all tenderers. So there's, 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 that's what's specifically written in our tender documents. Um, it allows us to, to look at what someone has left out. So they might have, uh, or they might be missing something that they haven't quite got yet, but we can work with them to allow them to do that, to, to meet that time frame. So we took, we take um, very much a case by case basis, the risks of the work, the risk of the contract and the risk of what they're short. So it allows us to make a, a diligent decision as exposed to, as soon as you fail to cross a T, we, we exclude you. So we don't want to do that. It actually gives us good flexibility to work with people where it's in our, where it's in, Council's interest. Yeah, I guess I'm thinking fr from it from both sides. I, I think the flexibility is really good because absolutely, I, I know local people who said that to me. They've said, "Oh, it's just too much information to provide when we're trying to do all these things." So we just do what we can and hope that they'll consider it. But my concern probably is more around how you make that decision or de delineation around. So we've accepted non-conforming tenders for this, but we. We haven't for that or it's more in the instances where a local contractor or somebody might not be considered because their tender was non-conforming and, and you've made that decision I guess is there a checkpoint or is that something that you would run past the CEO or by the general manager like how do you actually determine because there's there's opportunity there for um, different decisions to be made based on and I, I get the flexibility but I also get sure. how do you manage that yeah, through you, Mr. Mayor. So that, that's made by the person who's got the procurement delegation for that value. So if you're looking at a highly considered, um, uh, say, for example, my delegation is up to 200,000 after that, I've got to come down the hallway. Um, if there's a decision to made to exclude a non-conforming tender, um, that'll be made by me or recommended to me in that decision-making process. It really, the one thing is, and in, in, I, I fully appreciate what you're saying, the, the main one we have had in the past is where some people are, to be polite, are not even close to, to meeting the requirements of the documents and, and they just say it's too hard. We look at it very much. Most people we try to, particularly if they're local, is to encourage them to get in contact with the procurement team if they're unsure about what they can and can't do as far as the documentation goes. Um, but what we do like to see, and I'll say to the council politely, we do like to see best efforts. And then if someone is short, there's a, there, is a, there is a gap in some of those where people are, are, have missed something or they've just misunderstood and we'll normally talk to them. Um, and there's other ones that have just not even close to meeting the documents because it's – and they do need to meet some minimum requirements sometimes. So um, we always encourage people that if they get in touch with the procurement team. So I just, just wanted to highlight that, Council, but we do try to steer people there if they do need assistance, if they get in contact with us early so but from a decision point of view if if there's if i'm on the tender panel with three other people or two other people um they'll give me a list of um they'll identify where someone may be a risk or non-conforming and then i'll go through that process where someone will make that decision who's delegated to do that yeah i guess that's an area that i think maybe we need to i i certainly appreciate the process and the delegations um but i i've heard previous years you know that by bias of favouritism or that we've used somebody before. Excuse me, Councillor Time. Oh, sorry. Yep, sure. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, further speakers? Mr. Just, just I don't know if you need this. Um, LG Tender Box closed in uh, May 21. So uh, it's a local buy, and, and I'm not sure if this is the full answer to your question. We can certainly bring back more, but LG Tender Box closed about May 21. It uh, was transferred over, and it's a local buy service. So um, again, LJQ, statutory. Um, they transferred to vendor panel, and they had a period of time where they overlapped each other, and then they moved across to vendor panel. So we can bring more back, or is that what you were chasing? Yep, yep. Yeah, yeah. so local buy, for whatever reason, and I probably can't give you the detail why, but they transitioned out of... Uh, LG tender box and they went across the vendor panel and they still run it. Thank you, Mr. CEO. Okay, we read to go to the vote, um, noting that Mr. CEO is going to take Councillor Duff's issue on notice as a question, question on notice. We'll get some legal advice around whether or not Councillor is able to or under what circumstances Councillor can consider um, anything over 200,000 through local buy, yeah? So that'll, that'll be clarified in the future. All right, we'll go to the vote. Those in favour, carry it down, Thank you all.
right. Nine, uh, sorry, we're up to 8.1, local recovery and resilience grants projects under the DRFA Category D funding. It's at 127. And I'd like to welcome our Disaster Resilience Officer, uh, Omay, to the Chamber. Welcome, Linda. Would you like to come forward and participate in the discussion? Um, General Manager Omay, with your consent, uh, could we ask the Disaster Resilience Officer to provide us with an overview of her report? Yeah. So we'll go to you now, thank you. <laughs> Through you, Mr Mayor. The survey results came back, so we've looked at doing some projects. <clears throat> in line with the human and social events that have been proposed, are in line with the survey results and the Queensland floods, um, the state recovery and resilience plan. So just a quick note on a couple of them. So we've got 10 minutes with the master, the three C's, which is coffee, cake and a chat, um, reef and beef night out with a mental health guest speaker, paddock yarn and information session. So that'll be more focused around primary producers. We've got recovery training for local agencies, um, staff, which is generally presented by QFES, some mental health first aid training, um, some workshops and a pillowcase project. Along with, we've got 500,000 for flood signage and there's also 100,000 um, put on the table as a motion put forward by Councillor Shoemaker. Well, thank you very much uh, for that, Disaster Resilience Officer. Have I got your title right? I, think I have. Good. Thanks, Linda. Um, okay, well, let's, let's get this. Uh, what I'd like to do first of all, Councillors, is that do you want to have a discussion on this or do you want to get the motion up? Have it discussion. open discussion. Okay, let's go on an open discussion. Floor's open. Councillor Duff. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. I think it's really exciting. It's fantastic what we've got that funding and there's certainly a lot of work gone into the proposal and I'm keen on a lot of the, st the parts of the proposal. There's just one that I have flagged and I've already spoken to, um, to um, our resilience officer, Linda, about, about it and I just think that the 45000 just for one night in, um, I believe it's in Kingaroy, I just would rather see that either be broken up to five halls at $9,000 or to 10 halls at 4500 because I'd like to see that go right around our region. I don't think that, I think if you just have it in Kingaroy, there'll be a lot of people miss out. We're talking about mental health and big, and um, I don't think it's, you know, there's people from the far areas in our region that wouldn't travel to Kingaroy. If we brought the that, that sort of um, opportunity out to those um, halls, it's, it's, we're always trying to use our halls, I'd actually favour the 10 halls at 4,500 each, but uh, manager Linda, well, Linda said that she was struggled to get to deliver that. Well, I just wonder whether we could make it the five halls, which would be Mergen, Nanango, Kingaroy, Wandai and Blackbutt, to have events at the, all of those five rather than one at 40, at, at, um, and that would be $9,000 for five halls. So that's just my thoughts. Okay, we can take that into consideration. Further, councillors, councillor Henshin. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you, yeah. Look, just on that reef and beef night out in the five halls, um, can you just elaborate a little more on what that could be, or, or the process there? Because the other thing I'm bring to chambers' attention that P a local PNC group is holding a, a fundraiser um, for their school. And I certainly don't want to clash or take away from any of those. So can you just elaborate on what that possibly be if it was five halls of $4,500 each? The $4,500 would do what? Sorry, sorry, yeah, five halls, $9,000 each. That, what will that do? Through you, Mr Mayor. So we do actually have the paddock yarn and information sessions. Um, we do have five locations at $1,800 each. Now, I, don't, I know that doesn't sound much, but... In perspective, it's provide a barbecue drinks and a guest speaker to speak at those locations as well. So instead of having a sit down meal, you'd have a um, barbecue and drink. So it'd be a little bit more low key. In relation to the brief and beef night with a mental health speaker, you wouldn't get obviously a barbecue for that. You might get a sit down meal. Um, it would be have to be capped at the prices. We actually have gotten some um, quotes back in relation to what that might cost. And if we're 
for producing like local primary producer food, um, it's in relation to probably somewhere in the vicinity of thirty to fifty thousand um, fifty dollars each. Thank you. And just another quick question, Mr. Mayor, if I may, at the agricultural sessions with um, South Burnett Growers and the organised association slash organisation, hundred thousand. Just a quick overview on that too. Agricultural sessions there uh, underneath the. Uh, it's in the second section, $100,000. Um, yeah. um, okay, yep. Yeah, thanks, Councillor Henshaw. Uh, okay, Councillor Schumacher, did you want to speak to that $100,000 as to what your intentions were? Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, certainly, I think, I think there's... Um, a lot of information here. Um, certainly the $100,000 was about trying to establish a South Burnett Growers Group or an organisation or working with existing organisations um, to enable growers or people in agriculture in the region to make some decisions for themselves around what kind of things that may help them to build resilience in um, their operations. So I'd spoke to some growers who were interested in learning more about irrigation and what they do for water management practices. And I know, for instance, because I've walked on some farms where they're doing um, work at places like Pacataringa or in Blackbutt with their avocados where they're measuring um, soil moisture. And I think the idea of this funding was about enabling or setting up a group of people, people who maybe were agronomists in the area or people who run large operations in the area, who might have some ideas about things that they could share and create a, a program or a structure of events or activities around that. So that really for me was about empowering the people who have been impacted by the disaster to make some decisions about the things that would help improve their resilience in their operations or the things that they do. So um, it might be things like the grower group might decide they want to go to Bundaberg on a bus and they want to have a look at how they're growing and processing macadamia nuts in, in Bundaberg and how they could transition their dry land crops to grow macadamia nuts into the future, what that looked like. Um, it really was up to, and I know there's some work to be done in terms of identifying who those people were, who might be interested in coming to the table. But I've also known through um, the many networks that we have that there's a real interest and often there isn't the money to support the activities that the group might like to do. A great one, for instance, is the South Burnett Grazing Network. Um, you know, Councillor Henshin, I know you've been to a couple of events and I know that when they're given funding for an activity, they deliver, like, the value that you get in the community because they're the people making the decisions about the things that they need. And so I guess my intention was to try to bring some of those key stakeholders together to make some decisions and to give them a sizeable amount of money to do something meaningful in the region. Um, so that's basically the scope, um, and I had provided quite a bit of that in the notice of motion I put forward, but happy to recirculate that for, for council to consider prior to the, the, to the general me meeting. Have I answered the question? Yep. Um, am I right to ask some questions, Mr Mayor? Um, so my, my thinking is this is a great, um, I know you did the survey, it's wonderful to read that um, out of 1,600 surveys that were sent out, Sorry, 1,200 because 400 were returned. We got 200 in three days of consultation, we got 250 surveys. Like that's quite a large survey response. Um, and I know that survey was very much around asking people, you know, were they interested in being part of resilience activities? Um, my thinking is, and I know we've talked about it, is what kind of strategy work, what opportunities are there for council now to take that information from the survey and to take the proposal you've put forward and actually set some set some measures. Like I know you were looking at KPIs. I just I can't see any of that strategy here. So I was kind of expecting to sort of see what is it we what is it we're aiming to deliver. How are we going to measure that we've been successful? And if if these are the tactics, if this is how, 
I'm cool with that, but I'm, I'm thinking bigger picture, that strategy piece. Linda, what, what works in play around that? Through you, Mr Mayor. So the um, project list proposal actually has to go back to QRA by the 30th of March next year, which is very soon considering we've got a break coming up and so it doesn't give us many weeks to put together that. The reason why I've, I've actually started collating that information, but the reason why it hasn't been processed yet, I needed to for this to come to council for you guys to say, okay, well, these proposed projects look great. Um, what doesn't work, what should work and where we move from there. So all of that will continue after the Christmas break as in once the projects have been concreted and we've put projects forward, we can then move on to making um, decisions which enable us to, for example, they in their proposed pro projects, they ask for your proposed works, does it align with recovery and resilience, what are the benefits and what is the supporting evidence and how are you going to spend that money? So all of those will, all of those details will come about after the projects have been listed. Yeah, I guess that's where I'm probably struggling to support this. Not because I don't agree with what you're trying to do, but it's because I can't see the detail around those things. Um, so, you know, it says that we'll have a, a, a reef and beef night out with a mental health guest speaker. Well, what are the metrics around that? What will say we've been successful, um, how many people will be involved and what key messages do we want them to leave with? Like, um, I guess I'm really excited by this and excited by the work that you've done. I know you've done a mountain of work. I just don't think we can sort of see it here in the report. So um, March, yes, recognise the time period, but I guess I'd be keen to have a workshop or something to, to really unpack, like I've, I know you circulated the survey results, but to really unpack what it is that we are aiming to achieve and how we will know that when we've invested this million dollars, we've been successful. That's my question, really. Um, and the other thing I'm very mindful of, and I'm not sure, my secondary question is, how have you been collaborating with those working in this space? Because I know Wendy Agar's got some significant funding, FRRR, Red Earth, everyone's talking resilience. What roundtable discussions have there been with those players that have sort of said, we're working on this and this is how we're pulling all this together to get the best outcomes for the South Burnett? Yeah, through you, Ms. Smith, I might just talk to about that, that strategy piece that Council Shoemaker is talking about. So the, the state developed after the, the flood events, the Queensland State Recovering Resilience Plan. and so. Um, that was highlighted in, in the, um, it's not in the report here, but in the PowerPoint presentation that went around. So from those survey results, we, we're looking at those, um, those key elements from that state disaster, so whether it be community, community wellbeing, economic recovery, and trying to align um, our recovery activities against those that were identified in the state. So looking at that local level, so whether it be resilience, building, capacity building. So, yeah, there's a whole body of work in the strategy document. So this is this is like the, the, the summary of the, the projects, but but we have got a matrix that will, will feed those projects through to identified um, resilience projects that were identified to the state and that were echoed in, in our survey results. So, yeah, so, so we have got that as a, another document that, that we're working through that will actually... Yeah, just show that connection between what the projects are, where they're trying to, to um, address community wellbeing, and so that might be a lot of those those things. Infrastructure, disaster resilience, so that will be another um, um, category in that. So, so we are working on that. It's just not in the in in the report there. So, just yeah, I think that's what you were getting at is that that plan is being developed, and we're just sort of working them um, sort of in consultation with QRA and and. and trying to develop the projects and the plan at the same time, I suppose. Yeah, I, I guess I'm just mindful that as the Board of Council, we're accountable for the million dollars and accountable to say this is how we've achieved these outcomes. And so I'm supportive of the ideas you've got here and, and um, I think it's, it's great. I can certainly recognise the amount of work that's been done, but I'm not going to sign checks until I really understand what that strategy is and what that plan looks like 
and what success will be. So I think um, there's lots of things we've learned and I would probably like to have a workshop or something in the new year with that plan or at least receive the plan so that um, we're across. Like we, we can speak, talk up what you're doing and not, you know, be unsure around what it actually means because I know there's a lot of work that's gone in. Councillor Erkins. Thank you. Through you, Mr. Me. Um, so I'd just like to see, to know, so the reef and beef night out, so who actually goes to that? Through you, Mr Mayor. So the Reef and Beef Night Out um, with the Mental Health Guest Speaker. So the reasoning for this event being held in Kingaroy to start with is largely due to the fact that the mental health in Kingaroy was a priority one. Um, I've also had current quotes from the caterers to provide local produce, so it's much cheaper. The ones that went to that probably about 18 months ago um, was solely focused around primary producers. Given the impacts this time that have come back from the survey results, um, the community wanted some, a guest speaker and some mental health um, dinners. A little bit like when we did primary producers 18 months ago with COVID. So, I, see, I wasn't um, a part of any of that. So, so who goes to it? So we'll open the floor to this one if it's being held in Kingaroy. Um, we can approximately hold or cater for 300 people. There will be, given that the impacts in Kingaroy were mental health as a priority one, it will be open to community members as well as primary producers. So, and then do they pay to go to that? This will be um, free of charge, so it'll be a three-course meal. Um, there'll be no cost associated with attending that so night you, out. So how do you decide who goes? It'll be first in, first serve. So the people that will want to attend will are generally the people that have filled out the survey and said that they're struggling with their mental health, um, and they'll generally be the ones that will probably come and put their hand up first. Okay. Um, so going down to the flood signage, so is that, what's that? Is that like at the, they automatically come on? Is that those? Yeah, General oh. Manager, if I could just interject, um, General Manager Meehan, um, can you give us a bit of an overview? Is that okay? Can you give a bit of an overview as to what you see, where you see that money going in terms of flood signage? Are we looking at those permanent, signage or is it also going to be some of the transport you know some of the portable stuff because it seems that in the floods we had issues with having enough signage that we could actually take out in the ute and put on the road um th thanks gm yeah through you mr mayor so i've just got it in front of me here so we're looking at approximately 60 roads to install signs um they won't be flashing ones flashing ones are, are very expensive we're looking to either install um water overhead or road closed advance warning signs Okay. Or the indicators, um, road flooding, subject drive to conditions, whatever is suitable okay. for so, those. So like, things that stay up all the time. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. So we're looking for those. Yep. Um, we have looked at a couple of other councils. So Brisbane just did a new set, which have got flashing ones, and they've also got ones that they drop down. The stand Western Downs have got an older version because the standards keep changing, as yeah. council would be aware. So we're looking for the most fit for purpose sign for that road. So there's 67 roads that we're looking for that. The other one is with the temporary run. So exactly what you said, Mr. Mayor. So we have we've put together for a package of signs. Uh, we're looking to hold um, um, a number of storage. Um, um, facilities in each of the the depots plus signage racks that we can put on. We did look at a trailer option. Trailers are actually uh, you can carry more gear, but they're hard to turn around. Yeah. So we're actually getting portable racks made up. So if it's me going out, it would be my Ute. I take from that rack, so we've okay. got more signs. Um, so we can actually put those um, in there as well. So so we've gone for permanent. So we've gone for a number of um, advanced warning signs for road closed ahead drop downs. Water over road indicators, you know, the, the flooding drive to conditions, that sort of sign, and also the storage and the, and the more temporary one. I fully acknowledge that the more temporary signs we have, the better. And if they are reserved for that, it's it's so much easier if those signs are reserved for an emergency so they're not out on a roadwork site. So when you need them, you can get them. So um, that was our intent for that. So we have um, that one there. Happy to just touch on the trailer if, if that assists while I'm there also. Um, we, we have come into... Um, uh, in discussions with um, QPS that there is an opportunity for a shared trailer that they have um, sourced 
um, that we may be able to use for rural areas and also the, it's a, quite a large generator. Um, they would be looking to supply the, the, trail, uh, the generator to us either to council or in the shared arrangement with, with QPS. Um, we plan to base that in Prost and it will power the whole. There's some modifications we need to make to that. Um, in conjunction with that, they don't have a trailer to transport, so we would supply the trailer as part of that so we could use that. It will also give us the opportunity to, to transport that generator if we have a needs base issue in another town or another facility uh, that we could use that. So we think it's a really good outcome that we're working currently through with the local inspector. So just if council's wondering what that project is about. So that's where they've come from. Thank you, General Manager. Okay. Um, I, I think there, there has been heaps of work and, you know, I sat with you um, for a short while talking to some of um, the people in the survey, but I think I'd have to agree with um, Councillor Shoemaker. You know, I'd like to sit down and discuss it more. This, I, I think the $45,000, while I love a seafood night, I, I just have... <laughs> I just have concerns as to how that is... Um, Spread. I think it's a lot of money that we could possibly reach more people by doing something um, more affordable. But congratulations, it's a well job. Councillor Duff. Well done, sorry. Uh, sorry, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, I, I um, think that we. I'm keen to see our long-term outcomes and sustainability, and I think that that's the purpose of this whole exercise. And I know that when we had those functions at those halls, and we gave that the community groups, the, the money to run the event and, that, and then they got some money for their halls, that it was a long-term strategy to actually have that, build that community, that capacity and get them all to have a night out together and it was, the strategy was to reactivate those halls and get the community back meeting with each other. So I see that as a long-term outcome. Then the other option is we, we actually advocated to have people on the ground that actually with mental health to actually go out to, to the farmers. Is it an opportunity here to, to do that and see if, the, if, if, if we employed someone to go out and, and um, actually on the ground to talk to the farmers like we had those, um, we used to have the, the um, pastors like the... Um, Mark Wall and uh, he was did did an amazing job. Is it an opportunity to say, well, let's try have that happen and see what, and then use that as a catalyst then to to um, advocate then for further funding to keep that going. If we could prove that that was you know a really good outcome, that kind of stuff. Because like a one night forty five thousand dollars and you get certain number of people a lot of people miss out and they have a night out but is that going to build capacity is that going to make it so that we've got something that we've you know that we can um, piggyback off into the future so I'm just keen to um, workshop it and see what what else we can do thank you councillor general major Mahi, the capacity to be able to engage person or persons to move throughout the community um, to enter into discussions or provide support to our rural community, people in our rural communities under the guidelines? Yeah, we'd have to review. I imagine that, that there certainly would be. We would have to go back and, and review the, yeah, the, the, the funding split and what, what you could, could and couldn't do. I, I was just going to suggest with, the, with that 45,000 and the reap and beef, we could just, when we bring that back, have that as community wellbeing events and then we can determine later on like the mix of that rather than... So the 45,000, yes, it would be an event. You'd have a marquee guest speaker. You'd have a free free night out sort of thing. So it would be a, a thing. Or, or yeah, as Councillor Duff is suggesting, you could have those small modest events without a, uh, you know, a paid guest speaker or, you know, and... Um, spread them across so yeah so we could certainly look at that was going to suggest that we just sort of just earmark that for those community functions um but not not just a one sort of major event um and yeah i suppose we just look at yeah just the engagement of of, of officers and that would sort of you'd chew up a lot of the um the funds relatively quickly i know that that um resilience officer is, is talking with with NEMA and some of the other organisations and so where there is other funding that we can access and try in partnership. Um. 
Councillor Jones. Yeah, th thanks, GM. Councillor Jones. Yeah, thanks, Mayor. Um, yeah, I look. I just want to congratulate Linda on putting this together to start with. There's been a lot of work going into it. Um, I don't disagree with the comments that have been around the reef and beef night. I think um, I just I just see some people. Yeah, we're going to target the 300 people, but I I just know that there will be people out there that put their hand up and go and want to get there that don't really deserve it. I just, I think, I don't know that we target the right people. I'd like to see that spread across the region. I just think there's that opportunity for people to take advantage of a, of a free night that, you know, take up space of other people that really deserve to be or should be there. So how we split that up. And um, just the other thing with the um, Councillor Shoemaker's explanation with the agri agricultural sessions, don't disagree with that, but $100,000 is, is a large amount of money and, I, and it was a good explanation, but I, I just noticed that paddock yarn and information sessions and various resilience workshops, I think those people also will have an opportunity to go to those and I, I would think that resilience workshops held across the region would be to try and gain that exact information that, and they can put that forward. I'm not saying that we don't fund or have a fund there um, at some stage, but $100,000, I just don't, I think we can spread that across and combine that. And you talk about officers going out into the community and talking, there may be an opportunity to use some of that money to fund, fund some of them short term. So um, just something that I picked up. I, look, and I, it sounds like we're bloody picking it to pieces and all that sort of stuff. But I honestly, I was with you down there and other councillors as well. You've done a wonderful job and to put this forward, I just think, as everyone's indicated, I think there is some fine tuning just needs to, done, to be done before we, we've got until March and yeah, it's gonna come up on us really quick. But I think what you've done there and what you've produced is a really good platform to start moving forward and getting everything together. Councillor Shoemaker has alluded to other community groups and organisations, we can talk to them, get a hold. We can do something really special. So congratulations on the work you've done so far, but I, they're just some of the, things that I've picked up on that I think we can improve on and spread that money across and get a better result. Councillor Potter. Um, thank you, Mr Mayor. Look, I too would like to congratulate you. I know how hard you've worked in this space, how many hours you've put into this, how many courses you've done to try and um, gain more knowledge and insight into a lot of these different things. I do have to say I probably agree with everyone with regards to that 45000 for the Reef and Beef Night out in Kingaroy and I know we've done um, uh, places, you know, and not even the, the dinner that we used to do. I'm thinking, do something completely different. Like, let's get a, a local band from that area. Like, if we go to Blackwood, we get a local Black Butt band. If we go to Nanango, we get a local Nanango band or something like that and have it, like, outside in a marquee so everyone can come, they can have a sausage, they can sit down, have a good night out, listen to music, and maybe we've got a lot of people that are advocates for for um, the Black Dog Institute and things like that within the area. And they would be more than willing to come and talk to um, to any of these, at any of these functions. And because they're local people, people probably feel a better connection with them. Um, and I think that that would be something along those lines because then you sit down, you eat music, listen to a speaker. Um, and also that um, I'm actually agreeing with Councillor Jones with regards to that, um, you know, if we can use you know, the agricultural sessions, maybe put a bit more money into the other section, but if some of that could be used for a, re, um, a resilience <laughs> officer in that space, I'd, I'd just see that that, as Councillor Duff alluded to, you know, when we had the last lot of officers through the Church of Christ, they, were, they really saved lives and there's no other way of putting it, you know, because I could ring him up and say, hey, I've had a phone call from someone with an issue. So, um, and I called him up and he just straight out there, first up, and no questions. He just went out there, spoke to the people, and um, literally it's a life-saving thing that we have for our community. And to have someone like that would, would be a godsend. Thank yeah. you, Mr Mayor. Thanks, Councillor Potter. Um, yeah, having listened to the conversation, um, <clears throat> I'm just wondering, just, just two points, whether we just uh, insert, as you suggested, their... Um, Officers that at line four we actually put in their community events to be determined. Um, and Mr. Sierra was just discussing about perhaps a workshop could be held in the new year um, to flesh out what those six events, what those events might look like. 
six events. I actually would like to see us have one in each division because if we look at – if we go, if we were to go sort of a sixth one, we could actually then maybe try and pick up the western corner out around Jurong Boonduma. I'm a little bit concerned by just having it in those five main centres that we've got a large number of prime producers out around Jurong Boonduma that we might actually miss in terms of local access, whether we could do something at Boonduma Homestead or somewhere like that. Um, and then have six events at seven and a half thousand dollars each. But I guess the final detail could be worked out at a workshop, just to give Linda a little bit more feedback. Is everyone happy to sort of get down that path? If we just keep it broad at this stage. Yep. And the other thing I wanted to comment on was with the hundred thousand. I've always supported the concept of, you know, um, work, putting in place a framework whereby we can stimulate stimulate initiatives that will provide future that will help build capacity in our region for particularly um, productive diversity, you know. Um, so item B, the fourth point there, talks about community capability and educational activities. And one of the challenges for us in the future will be to grow our ag, our ag sector um, through diversification strategies. Um, and it might be that the climate and the weather patterns are such that the current or historical cropping arrangements may need to change. Um, and we may need to need, move into different timing of cropping, different types of crops, uh, a greater emphasis on horticulture or whatever, however that might look. So I think we do need to do a body of work there. And of course, we've got the ag strategy that Baido have been working on and have done a lot of work in this space. But, but So certainly not discounting the, the value and the importance of doing that as part of our long-term agricultural plan. And I raise this with the um, with the ministers on Thursday about the importance of us having a very clear focus on agriculture as being one of the key drivers in the growth of our economy into the future um, and the importance of putting in place um, processes that are going to allow us to take it from not just production but through to processing that creates jobs and allow us to diversify our ag economy into areas that actually create more jobs on farm as well, um, which broad acre cropping often doesn't do. Um, so I think there is a lot of work that we need to do to focus in on this space uh, in relation to our 25-year economic roadmap, particularly in preparation for the imminent closure of Tarong. This is going to be a really important space for us to focus on in terms of agricultural development across our region. We've got to grow our ag economy if we're going to see our future, our region prosper. That's one of those key pieces in that strategy, I feel. But, but having said that, I am hearing what the councillors are saying about um, mental health and, res and individual resilience for our farmers. And I'm wondering whether we can perhaps look at, reconsider that $100,000 as much as I don't want to have to, because I think we do need to do a body of work there, whether we should reconsider that in terms of that being perhaps the more emergent priority right now. Um, to perhaps be able to, if possible, Peter, to be able to engage a person or persons over that 12 months for next financial year to actually go out and be mobilised and actually be going from farmer to farmer, engaging with them, collecting data, collecting information, sharing conversations, if that's something we see value in. So um, I'm wondering whether we can leave line four a little bit open to community events to be determined and whether we could consider with the agricultural sessions just maybe broaden that out so that council's got a little bit more time to think that one through as to how we might like to frame that up. Yeah, is everyone happy if we just broaden those two out? That at least allows you to bring something to the next meeting, Mr. CEO, and then we can workshop it out later. Yeah, or would we hold it off then to the January ordinary or February ordinary? I'm just conscious of your time frame, though, Linda, haven't you? Because you've got to get this into the DRA, so um, to QRA by March, but. We've got a break and you've got to do all the paperwork. So, Linda, um, General Manager May, what would be the, when do you need this from us? I think we need to give us a date that we have to work to. Um, do you need this before Chris, before we break? Sorry to put you on the spot, but. Through you, Mr. Mayor, I believe that we may be able to probably get some workshops done January. I think is fair. So if we perhaps look to do something in January, maybe we could get through the January ordinary, Mr CEO? Could I mean, the longer we push this out to Mr Mayor, we've just got to realise that my secondment finishes at the end of the year. So we have the first three months and then we've got, then I'll have nine months left to be able to 
finalise those projects. Right, okay. Well, it's important that we know that. So we'd really need to have this wrapped up by the January ordinary, wouldn't we? Okay. So is Council happy if we just amend the recommendation today in light with that? Mr. Sierra, yeah, could you give us a little bit of guidance as to, how, as to what you, we could put forward as a, as a resolution from the committee? Thanks. Oh, just pen, pondering the thought of the wording as it, um, um, if we, so the intent wouldn't be not to bring this back at all to the December meeting, but just to um, have the workshops in, in January and with the January ordinary. Um, as simple as this would be, um, that the matter lay on the table pending a January workshop and be brought back to the January ordinary meeting. And then that all save us trying to I mean, I've made notes of the to line four and the ag session, as well as um, at Councillor Shoemakers before from the workshop in the new year. So, if we just leave it pending the workshop in January to be held in January and uh, representing at the January ordinary meeting. Is anyone on? We'll go to Councillor Shoemaker shortly. But is anyone uncomfortable with that? Well, we'll let's get around the table. Councillor Shoemaker, then we'll come across to Councillor Henshin. Proposed motion? Yeah, no, I, I definitely think there's some work to be done here. I think we need to think about the strategy, what we're trying to achieve and how these things will actually deliver on that. And I've just been reading over the 65 pages of feedback and I would encourage my councillors to really look at some of that feedback that's been given to our council around the things that um, locals have actually, have actually contributed here. Um, I don't think this has been publicly shared but um, there's quite a lot of requests for across the region for information on climate workshops, nutrition, carbon farming, um, diversity on farming, regenerative farming. You know, it really demonstrates that we are at a turning point and people are thinking differently about their operations. There's also a lot about our health and wellbeing. Yes, talking to somebody is one part of the, the puzzle, but I think there's nothing in here around health um, in terms of activities or opportunities or things that would actually change behaviour. Um, and that's what I really want to think about is what, what are the things that we're actually doing as part of this to build resilience and capacity and change behaviour. A lot of people who responded to our survey said their health was, was poor and that they, they needed, they wanted to do more around their health and wellbeing. Um, I think particularly young people, you know, I think there are also a number of things happening. I really do want to understand how we've been talking with the other bodies in our region who have been funded because I don't want to see us doubling up on things. You know, we need to take this money and actually achieve some really tangible outcomes with it. So as part of that workshop, I really want to see the strategy document that you've been working on. What are the measures? What are the metrics? How do we go back to these people? Some people have not given this council very good feedback at all, very nice, have not said nice things about us as councillors. I want to know how we're going to change that, turn that mindset around. Okay, Councillor Henshin. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Yeah, just uh, a comment you made in relation to what we could do within each division in the shore. I think that's a wonderful initiative because when you look at what we've got across the Burnet and then we could incorporate something in our workshop in relation to the dams, we have two dams in different divisions. We have uh, Bunya Mountains, we have Nanango's 100 year centenary. I think if we take a long, hard look at uh, our calendar for next year, we might be able to come up with things that we can incorporate within that moving forward. Um, a classic example was the Wurulan 50 year time capsule the other day. That was an absolutely sensational thing. They're still talking about it down there yesterday when I was down in Wurulan. So I think across the board, the divisional thing uh, and workshop, what we might be able to implement in each division, like I said, Nanango's got their 100 year, Proston's got their 100 year. We've got the dams, uh, mental health is mentioned there with mental health courses and first aid courses, various resilient workshops. There's, a, there's certainly, um, that's unlimited where you can go with that. So yeah, we really look forward to those workshops next year. Yeah, thanks, Councillor Henshin. I think there's been a good body of information that's come out of this discussion, you know, that you can take on board around, you know, um, the various issues that go to, you know, holistic health, 
um, health of health and healthy and active lifestyle that then goes to mental health, a whole range of things that we can look at there. I'm sure that workshop would, could bring out a lot of really good options. Um, but Linda, thank you very much for bringing this report forward. It's been a really good uh, conversation activator to get that on the table. So thank you very much. And um, and I'm sure that we could all work together to come up with something that's going to be really great for the region. So thank you. Um, we, we've got this, uh, we have a motion now, Mr. CEO has given us that the matter lay on the table, pending workshops to be held in January and representing the list of projects at the January ordinary meeting. Do we have a mover? Councillor Potter, seconded Councillor Duff. We'll go straight to the vote. Those in favour, carried unanimously. Thank you all. Okay. Um, uh, sorry, 9.1. I'd like to now welcome Councillor Potter to present her Community Development, Arts Heritage and Library Services Portfolio Report at 1.32. Thank you, Councillor. Um, thank you, Mr Mayor. I'd actually um, just like to um, present my report as read um, and move as said. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Do we have a seconder? Councillor Jones. Speakers? To the vote, those in favour? Carry unanimously. Thank you all. Thank you, Councillor Potter. 9.2, General Practitioner Services at 1.35. Um, okay, right, we've got that there. We've got a recommendation uh, that the Southport Regional Council accept the report for information from Dr. Christopher Cowling, Executive Director, Rural Darling Downs Health. Do we have a mover? Councillor Potter, thank you. A second to Councillor Jones. Speakers, Councillor Potter, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. This was taken through to the um, to the to the regional um, consultative committee meeting through to Toowoomba actually, and um, this is a you can see the letter that we got in response to that. Um, but when I brought it up at that particular meeting, it, it was really quite um, it was really quite disturbing to think that every single community um, sort of west of Brisbane literally has this issue. Um, and we really need to do something. And I think this is something where we as council need to advocate with um, with federal, um, whether it be with regards to um, university spaces, I think, and also with regards to the LGAQ as well, because I think this is a space where we as council can maybe, um, because we're not the only council in, in this situation. There are many, many others, and I would say just about every other council um, within Australia is probably having this issue now. So I think um, that we as a council, the best thing we can do is advocate through um, ALGA and LGAQ to to bring these issues forward. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Yes, thank you very much, Councillor Potter. And this issue was certainly discussed um, with the Resource Council's Mayors in Parliament uh, House where we met on Thursday. And in speaking with the CEO of LGAQ and her officers, we did uh, indicate to them that we would like to see the LGAQ mobilise its activities and partner with um, ALGA to make representation on this to the federal government as a key issue, a critical issue, for the future of regional communities across Australia. Because this isn't just about health service, this is about, this is about the, broad, broader, um, the, the broader viability, uh, economic prosperity of our regions. If we lose GPs and doctors, we're going to lose people from our regions because people can't live here if they haven't got health services. Uh, just in response to what Councillor Potter was saying there, um, and so that 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 is that's been now taken on board by the LGAQ. We'll continue to follow that up. the The second thing is that um, that of course Dr. McAllister has been very active in this space personally, um, and so we have through Exec Services reached out to our federal members of parliament um, and endeavour to try and have a teams meeting between the three federal members with Dr McAllister. He's got a very, very good understanding of the issues here. Uh, he sits he sit on many boards. He's on the, on the general practitioner's training board for Queensland. Um, and I think he has a very good understanding of what needs to be done by federal government to properly address the diminishing primary healthcare services in regional communities. You know, the loss of GPs, the reduction in GPs. He's at the coalface. We haven't had a great response, and, I, and I'm disappointed to say publicly that I'd like to see better from our federal MPs. Um, Lou O'Brien's chosen to meet with Dr McAllister one-on-one, -on -one, uh, and that's fine. Um, I think Colin Boyce said he was only available until this week, and um, David Littleproud's office have failed to respond 
to many approaches we've made way through exec services. Um, so I'm probably at the point, and I've shared with Dr McAllister that I've, I've done all I can to try and get our MPs activated on this, but I'm very concerned that neither side of politics at the federal level have taken this seriously. And it is a serious issue for our region and many regions across rural regional Australia and suburban Australia. Um, so thanks very much, Councillor Potter, for the work you've done on this with the local committee. Um, and look, I'm keen to get feedback from, from my colleagues as to how, you know, what your thoughts are around how we should move forward with this um, in terms of getting, as you say, federal advocacy and getting someone on either side of government, on either side of politics at the federal level to listen to what we're saying out in our rural communities because, because it seems to be that neither major political party is interested in seriously doing anything about the loss of GPs in rural communities. Yeah, so anyway, they're, they're my strong views on the matter. Um, Councillor Duff, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. I, I actually have sent a um, pr proposal through to Kimberley, an, a, a resolution if, um, that, that we write to the Federal Minister of Health raising concerns about GP shortages in our regional communities and seeking a team's meeting with the Minister. So that I don't know whether you want to add that to this or how, we'll, how you want to... Have we'll take that as a, as a foreshadowed. Thank you, Councillor. Yep, we can address that next. Councillor Henshin. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Through you. I'll just share with the Chambers this, this morning I had a conversation, a phone call from a gentleman. This goes further than GPs and medical practitioners. It's the effect it has on the people that can't get to a GP. This particular gentleman has a birthday coming up he has to have a medical done for his licence renewal. He cannot get into a doctor until mid to the end of January, which means he will not have a licence for from six to eight weeks. Now, the Transport Department refuses to give some an exemption, whereas once upon a time they would, if you, had, you could produce a letter and stating that you can't get a medical on certain reasons. So this gentleman's at wit's end as to what he's going to do without a licence over the Christmas New Year period and into January. So it's a flow-on effect, not just with not having GPs or practitioners in our, in our region, and it's across the entire country, that this is having detrimental effect and it's so disappointing that our federal members and MPs aren't taking this up because there needs to be also something implemented where if you can't get your driver's licence because you can't get into a medical practitioner, there should be some leniency shown or an exemption shown for that. Honestly, this is a mature age person. He also has to have another medical because to keep his truck licence. He's now seriously thinking of relinquishing that and not having a truck licence, which will be a major effect on, on his day-to-day -day life and what he does, and he's just beside himself. So that's just one example of what's happening, happening in our community and all across this, the country, what it's doing to our, not just our mature people, but everybody. And that's just one example, and there's many of them. So something as well as medical practitioners, I'd like to see our governments take a stance and say, well, OK, because of that, We've got to show some leniency or give some exemptions in the, in the case of not being able to get to medical practitioners. Yeah, and, and just on the note of that, in terms of Dr Chris Cowling is intimately aware of this and he's done some wonderful work in this space um, and uh, with our local group. But, but, you know, they've been working on this for some time. Councillor Potter's been working with the committee on this for some time. This isn't anything new. I know since I got into council, there's been a lot of discussions about how we can actually make our region more attractive to bring in more health professionals. But, but just some data that's been shared with us by uh, Darling Downs Health for the community, and, and that is that Kingaroy Hospital uh, had go through its, um, from memory, Kingaroy Hospital had uh, in, in, the, in the 1920 year, uh, through the ED at Kingaroy Hospital, there were approximately 14,000 patients go through. 21-22, 22,000. They're tracking this current financial year. Three years later, 24,000 people through the ED. Their data indicates that our population has grown in the last two years by 6% since the last census. 6% um, is a significant increase in our population. That is some 2,000 extra people now living in the South Burnett. Um, and we have had our emergency department have to increase its patient visitation by 71% in three years. So from 14,000 to 24,000 in three years, an extra 10,000 visitations. That's a massive increase in services that our hospital is trying to cover. And a, and a, and a um, portion of that 
is people presenting for primary health care because they cannot find a GP, they cannot get into a GP, they're on a waiting list. And Councillor Hench is exactly right. Dr McAllister indicated to me that he can't squeeze anyone in for at least a month. And he's only one. I imagine all the other GPs are in the same boat. And we are reaching crisis point in this country, in rural Australia, for primary health care. And it's time that government stood up and did something about it. Otherwise, we are going to lose our first world healthcare system that we've been so privileged to have for this long. Um, anyway, I've probably... I'll get down off my soapbox, but <laughs> other councillors, anyone else to speak to the matter? Thanks, Councillor well, Potter. I just wanted to put one more stat out there since we're putting them. So um, I was informed recently that we have about... Used to be, um, you know... 30 years ago, that 40% of the students that went through university to become doctors, 40% of those actually put in for being GPs. That has now gone down to below 20%, I believe. So um, they're all choosing specific fields. And so, you know, apart... So to me, that shows we, they need, we need more university spaces. And the federal government's the only one who can do that, I believe. Yeah, thank you, Councillor Potter. Anything further, Councillors, or we'll take that as closing comments and we'll go to the vote. Those in favour, carry unanimously. Thank you all. Councillor Duff, your foreshadowed motion. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. I'd like to move that, that this committee write to the Federal Minister of Health raising concerns about GP shortages in our regional communities and seeking a Teams meeting with the Minister. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, do we have a second? Councillor Potter, thank you. Did you want to speak to your motion, Councillor? Uh, I think it's fairly self-explanatory. It's in keeping with what um, the recommendation was from Dr Christopher Cowling was to advocate, and so that's what I'm saying. Well, we need to now um, follow his um, advice and advocate. So I think that that's what we can do here. Further speakers? Councillor Potter. Yeah, um, with regards to what Councillor Henshin was saying in the previous motion, can we make sure that that letter includes something along those lines with regards to the... Um, the medicals for for TMR and exemptions along those lines. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Yes, our NGP shortages and uh, implications for uh, elderly residents seeking licence renewals. with consideration given to extension periods being granted. Comfortable with that? Yeah. Yeah, and of course the National Cabinet, the National Cabinet has the opportunity to discuss that with the State Premiers, who then have the authority to be able to provide that through their local TMR offices. So um, the Minister could raise that at National Cabinet with all the Premiers Certainly the Queensland Premier could, could do that if they chose to. Yeah, thank you. Um, thanks, Councillor. So we've got that there. Councillor Duff, you're happy with that. Councillor Potter, you're happy with that motion. Can Speakers, just, Councillor Erkins. Um, can I just um, ask through you, Mr Mayor, the elderly residents, it's not only elderly residents, right. it's also residents who, um, people who have um, medical conditions that they need to have a licence check. Oh, so okay. it, someone who has... Diabetes, I believe they have to have a check before their license is renewed. So it's more, it, it does affect more than, um, you know, people with, um, do, uh, you know, different, yeah, different medical conditions. Yep. So we've just got yeah. re residents there. Implications for residents, we just leave it broad. We can pick that up in the correspondence. Happy with that? Councillor Potter's happy. You happy with that, Councillor Duff? Yep. Uh, Councillor Erkins, you happy with that? Um, maybe. Maybe if you could put in the implications for residents who require a medical certificate prior to seeking licence. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that sounds better. Very good, thank you. Okay, Councillor, Councillor Shoemaker. Yeah, thank you, Mr Mayor. Absolutely, always supportive of um, raising the voice for our community and um, at the table wherever we can. Uh, my, my question is too, I think there's... I think there's a lot in this space that we don't fully understand. Um, I think there are a number of GPs. I know you've spoken about Mr McAllister, but I, Dr McAllister, I know there are a number of GPs in the area who um, 
you know, would have feedback on this issue. I'm just wondering about the opportunity to sort of collaborate with some of those people who are in this area, who are um, every day working in this space, to really seek more information from them in terms of what would be relevant, what our ask is to the Federal Minister for Health, because I know the nursing shortages is a state and um, it's a state and federal issue. I know there's so much that's happened since COVID. Um, and I'm, I, I guess my question is I'm, I'm absolutely 100% in terms of raising the concerns about the GP shortages, but I guess my, my question is what is our ask? You know, is it that they put more GPs on? Is it... What, what is it that we're actually asking the Minister for Health to, yeah, to sure. do for us here in the South? Yes, today? yeah, look, happy to address that. Um, it certainly is It certainly is a multifaceted strategy. Um, it, it goes to a range of issues, and, and there may be more issues that other GPs can bring forward, but but um, it go, and certainly I shared the letter from Dr. McAllister with the Prem, with the Prime Minister at when through through um, Mayor um, through the Gladstone Mayor when they met when Federal Cabinet met in Gladstone uh, recently. And it was really a strategy, a number of elements of the strategy around uh, obviously debureaucratizing the process for engaging overseas um, doctors particularly, where that's taking up to two years through four different federal departments. It was, uh, another element was, as Councillor Potter's alluded to, um, providing additional funding for uh, university placements for medical graduates, um, providing an incentivisation system for uh, medical graduates to go out and practice in general practice, practice in rural and suburban practice. Um, look, address, and that could be through the HEC system, it could be through direct subsidisation, uh, addressing the fact that the Medicare rebate has been frozen for uh, a decade, um, and so now most GPs are almost, all GPs have gone away from bulk billing because of the gap between the cost of service and the fee that they can bulk bill. So that it probably had four or five key elements to it, but there could be more. And I'm wondering whether, in light of what you've said, Council, whether we should actually consider inviting certain general practitioners from across the region to come to the table at that discussion with the Minister and make it an open discussion around, well, what are the issues and what are the potential solutions rather than just having us as councillors sit around the room with the minister, should we actually bring in half a dozen GPs from across our region? Yeah. Yes, Mr Mayor, that's exactly what I'm thinking. Because, um, you know, at the end of the day, uh, as leaders of our council, our council operations are so much different to the, to the health needs. We know our community is suffering because of this, but I know there are people every day in this situation who has some very valuable feedback that I think would be very relevant um, to the Minister. So, absolutely, I think that would be important. Councillors, are we happy with the change to the resolution to incorporate the doctors, the GPs from across, right across the different towns in our region? Happy with that? Yep, no one's got any concerns, so you're happy with that, Councillor Duff and Potter? Yep, good, okay. Uh, Councillor Potter? Um, yeah, I just wanted, um, so if we want some of that information, the PHN actually run chapter meetings for the doctors within our area. So they'll do a breakfast meeting or lunch. So that might be a really good place to start if we have a chat with the PHN and they might be able to actually get some of that information from those doctors through their chapter meetings. If we could perhaps, sorry, Kimberly, this is a work in progress, this motion, that the council liaise with the PHN. Yeah, council liaise with the PHN and yeah, that'd be fine. Happy with that. Yeah. Okay, Councillor Rickens. Um, the local GPs, some are, uh, maybe just the um, practices because some are run by managers, not GPs. I know, for example, in Kingaroy, um, Oka Medical have taken over, Markwell Medical. But having said that, there are still GPs like Dr. Jim Eady, uh, Dr. Um, Dr. Fulcher's there at his practice. There's still a number of senior GPs there in those corporate practices. I think we've got a wealth of we've got a wealth of knowledge, haven't we, with senior GPs? Yeah. Um, is there any further speakers before we go back to Councillor Potter to close? No. Happy to go to the vote. Those in favour? 
carried unanimously. Thank you all. Uh, okay, so we're up to uh, 10.1, which is the minutes of the Youth Council at 1.36, where we have a recommendation that the uh, minutes of the Youth Council held in Warren Trust Chambers, Kingaroy, South Bennett Regional Council on Tuesday, 13 September, Tuesday, 11 October, and Tuesday, 8 November 2022, uh, provided for information. Sorry, that's the summary. Um, the Council receive and note the attached minutes of the Youth Council held on 13 September, 11 October, and 8 November 2022. Do we have a mover? Councillor Potter, seconded Councillor Henshin. Speakers? Councillor Potter, thank you. Um, just want to bring one point to attention is that the Youth Council, this is their last term. Um, we are going out now very shortly, so anyone between 14 and 24 will be putting the applications out shortly for them to apply for for next year's Youth Council. Youth Council members are allowed to do two terms con um, concurrently. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Potter. Further speakers? To the vote, those in favour? Carry you obviously, thank you all. 10.2, uh, request to enter sub-agreements with Kingaroy Cricket and Sports Club. That is at 1.46. Uh, General, oh, sorry, many, General Manager May, through you to Manager Poynton. Um, if you wouldn't mind giving us an overview, that would be much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, so we've received a request from the Kingaroy Cricket and Sports Club um, who have been working with their users um, for the Oval Lowell Vidler um, and they'd like to enter into more formal agreements. This is to support each user then being able to access infrastructure funding to, I guess, invest into the facility. Um, so under the terms of their lease between council and the sports club, they're required to seek council consent prior to subleasing or entering into any sort of sub-agreement. So this is essentially just a recommendation that we approve this. Um, we have been working closely with the group for a little while now um, to get this to this point. Um, and probably the only thing is that um, we encourage them in those sub-agreements to ensure that they have appropriate mediation clauses for ensuring any future conflict is that there's a resolution process. Thank you, Manager. So the recommendation is that the committee recommend to Council that approval be provided to the Kingaroy Cricket and Sports Club Incorporated under Clause 5.21 of the lease between the Kingaroy Cricket and Sports Club Incorporated and South Burnett Regional Council to grant licence to occupy to South Burnett Saints Australian Football Club Incorporated, Warula and Warriors Cricket Club Incorporated, Kingaroy Croquet Club Incorporated, Kingaroy Junior Cricket Association, South Burnett Thrashers Rugby League Club Incorporated. Is that Rugby Union? So I think, yeah, maybe it's a typo, is it? The Thrashers, are they Rugby Union? Yeah. So, sorry, I mean, you must never confuse the two. Um, <laughs> and uh, South Burnett Cricket Association Incorporated. Do we have a mover? Councillor Henshin, seconded Councillor Jones. Speakers? Councillor, Councillor Shoemaker. Um, yes, thank you, Mr Mayor. Certainly recognise the work that's gone in. My question was just, because uh, I know this talks about the reasons for wanting more formal arrangements is around grant funding, and I guess I just wanted an update from you, um, Manager Poynton, just around, so do these groups come, come together and discuss, like the just going to make something up like I want to put a slippery slide in the playground at the back of the club you know would they bring all groups together to to give approval to that or how how does it actually work in process or practice uh, thank you through you mr mayor so what will happen is um, that the groups will come together they'll decide on the projects and and they are fairly clear at this point, but appreciate that in some time in the future when those new committees might not be working as well or maybe unclear. Um, but any sort of infrastructure and development on the ground still has to come back for council consent underneath the lease. Um, so basically part of, I guess, council's process in approving those infrastructure, particularly infrastructure developments, is that um, we tick the box that they have consulted with all the users. Um, ideally, it would be great for them to have a, a master plan um, but it is a little bit, it is a lot to ask a community group to do a fully fledged master plan, but um, that's what we're hoping to achieve with them. Um, and it really will depend on the fluctuations with the sporting groups as well. Um, and yes, I apologise for mixing up league and union. <laughs> uh, thank you, manager. Thanks very much. Okay, any further speakers? No. Okay, happy to go to the vote. Those in favour? Carry unanimously. Thank you all. 
Uh, thank you, Manager Boynton. 10.3, I think, is going to be yours as well. Um, request to terminate lease, Kingroy Junior Soccer and Kingroy Touch, of course, at 148. And um, we'll go back to you. Thank you, Manager Point. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. So we had a request from Kingaroy Junior Soccer, who are our leasee for Area G, um, which is at the other end of that sporting precinct near the Town Common Hall. Um, they have entered into a memorandum of understanding with Kingaroy Touch Association, who has been a long-term user of that space um, and is a very uh, active club. Again, because Kingaroy Touch does not have any tenure, they're very limited to what grant funding they can seek to invest um, into, that, into that precinct area. Um, this particular lease um, is only 12 months old and it, for some reason, had not allowed subleasing. Um, so we couldn't do a similar process as to the, the report we've just dealt with previously. Um, so the groups basically got together and have provided a copy of an MOU to say that they're happy to enter a lease as joint tenants. And again, um, we'll be working with the group in that document to ensure that there's some mediation um, clauses there as well to ensure seamless um, workings between the two groups. Thank you, Manager. I might just go to... Yes, we'll um, go to Councillor Shoemaker. Thank Mr. you. Mr Mayor, I was just thinking, I do actually play touch football um, for the Kingaroy Touch Association. I Like, I'm a member of a team. I, I pay membership fees to play touch football. Um, so that being the case, I might actually just step out for this one. You comfortable with that, Mr CEO? Councillor's choice, yeah. Thank you, Councillor. OK. Yep. Um, Yes, yeah, so thank, thank you, Councillor Schubacher, yeah. Um, okay, so committee, we've got the recommendation there. You can see there are three elements to it as presented at page 148 of the agenda. Um, the first element goes to the 60 days notice. The second element goes to um, applying the exception under the local government regulation in relation to the uh, moving to joint tenancy over the 10 year period. And the third item goes to delegation to the Chief Executive Officer of the Power to negotiate, finalise and execute. Um, so as presented there, do we have a mover? Councillor Jones, seconded Councillor Potter. Speakers? Okay. We'll, we'll go to the vote. Those in favour? Carried unanimously. Thank you, Manager Poynton, for your work and we'll bring back Councillor Shoemaker. Thank you, Councillor Jones. Okay. Committee, uh, we'll move on to 11.1, .1, consideration of pig bounty, which is at 156. Uh, welcome, Manager Planning and Environment, uh, Brooks. Uh, and um, we, we might go to you, Daryl, for uh, an overview of the report, if you could uh, share that with us. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, through you, this obviously uh, came from a notice of motion from Councillor Duff, um, where we um, consider a... Um, a bounty on pigs and um, yeah so we've considered it done some uh, investigations spoken with Gympie Regional Council and we put the uh, report forward for uh, consideration. Thank you very much manager so we go to Councillor Duff to present your notice of motion thank you to present your motion thank you. Uh, thank you Mr Mayor that um, my motion was that council introduce a ten dollar per pig snout on feral pigs consistent with the bounty offered by Gibby Regional Council. So I'm, um, move, I'd like to move that. Sorry, Councillor, my mistake. I've actually, um, we need to lift it from the table first. Oh, okay. Yeah, thank you very much um, to, to Kimberley for making me aware. So procedural motion that the consideration of introduction of a pig bounty scheme be lifted from the table. Do we have a mover? Councillor Henshin, seconded Councillor Duff. Those in favour? Carrie University, thank you all. Back to you, Councillor Duff, thank you. Yes. Sorry, you missed me. My husband is a recreational pig hunter. Should I leave? Yeah, gee, this, this conflict of interest laws are problematic, aren't they? <laughs> Goodness me, I, my wife takes our dog to the park. Should I be out of the park discussions? Who knows? Mr CEO, sorry to put you under pressure. We'll go to you again. Thank you. Could, could the councillor just please repeat what he is or isn't? <laughs> he's, a rec he's an old <laughs> recreational pig hunter. So he goes out mainly driving around and comes home, but 
<laughs> Thank you, Mr. CEO. It really is, and this one's the councillor, whether she feels comfortable to stay or go or ask if she can believe she can do her role. It's, yeah, you would need to, um, if that's the case and the council raises it, you'd probably need to have the council consider her interest. Okay. Councillor, would you please leave the room while we consider your interest? Thank you. Yeah, she would you like to stay? You happy to stay? Well, I think we'd like to involve you if we think it's appropriate to do so. So perhaps you'd like to leave the room and we'll consider it for you. Thank you. Um, and so we'll go to we'll go around to the chamber to your thoughts. Uh, yeah. In the case in this conflict of interest, I'm a primary producer, so I have a vested interest in this as well in relation to a bounty. Do I have a conflict of interest there as well? Well, you could potentially have yeah, uh, benefit I mean, from this. So, um, wow. Bring the councillor back. Can I bring the councillor Bring the councillor back. back. I think we need to take some guidance from our CEO here as to how we move forward because Councillor Potter, you and I, well, hang on, your husband. No, he doesn't. We don't pick. No. My favourite. My uh, meat is pork, does that count? But anyway, sorry, I'm trivialising. One should not trivialise our, our, our laws. But anyway, this is what we've got to, haven't we? Um, Mr CEO, what are we going to do? All right, we need to go around the room. Anyone who thinks they've got a nature of interest, do we have quorum? Um, and then if there's a quorum, you can stay in the room while the, for the procedural that it gets left on the table. Um, if we don't have... Well, for, yeah, well, a couple of things. Um, there is, and, and, I, and I know it is tricky because these things come up in conversation, but, but there is a, a, a provision in the Act to advise in advance of the meeting for these, these sorts of questions. So if when you spot something, if in doubt, if you can send them through prior to the meeting because it is hard to answer them off the cuff, it is um, a lot of us, and again, the issues with the process, it really is a, a funny old process. But how many of you think they have an interest? So it'd be Councillor Erkins, Henshin and Jones so far. And I, and I would have a, have an um, interest as well. Everyone except for myself, I think. Yes, your husband doesn't engage. No, so five councillors. So I will need what you think your interest is. Uh, if you could just either tell us in the break or send it through and Mayor, if we could just have a procedural motion that we leave it lay on the table pending further advice. Thank you, Mr CEO. Thank you for your advice and fully respect the fact that you're going to need to get some, do some research on this. I'll move a procedural motion that it lay on the table uh, pending further advice. Seconded, Councillor Potter. Okay. Procedural motion to the vote. Those in favour? Yes, we can. We can on procedural, yeah. Uh, carried unanimously. Thank you all. Okay. We'll await our CEO's advice. Thank you, Mr. CEO. Do we, yeah. um, would you like us to go around and declare what what we're thinking our interests may be? We will need, I will need what yeah. you think the nature of the, yes, yeah, so that'd be lovely if you don't mind, please, Mayor. If, yeah, just if we could just run around. Can the we room. do that? We'll start yeah. with Councillor Shoemaker. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, I guess I'm just declaring that um, I too own rural property. Um, where we manage pests and animals, um, vermin as part of our being a, a good rural property owner. Um, I don't, however, I have, I, have, I have never actually engaged in, we don't actually have or haven't trapped any pigs or anything on any of our properties previously. Um, but yes, uh, I don't feel my interest would actually be any greater than any other person in the region who has rural property, who is meeting their, the, the needs of their responsibilities as part of the Biosecurity Act. Um, however, yes, happy, happy to note it and for further advice, particularly after um, recent events. So thank you. Councillor Erkins. Thank you, Councillor Dove. Um, thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, my interest is that we I have a rural property. We uh, tra trap, we don't trap pigs, but we do use the pig strength 1080. 
to try and um, eliminate as many pigs as we can. From time to time, we engage people to come in and shoot pigs on our property. That's pretty much it, I think. Thank you, Councillor Jones. Yes, Mr Mayor, my conflict is with the hip hypocrisy of the legislation that we operate under. This is just out of control and I want to make it very clear. This, I had conversations with Councillor Trevor from Bundaberg in RRTG meetings about exactly what you just spoke about. Are you or do you have a conflict if you attend a park where you have to vote on whether you're going to put new play equipment in there? This is out of control and that's my conflict but I do have a rural property that has the potential to have pigs on it and I haven't shot one <laughs> too slow to catch them and it's just out of control. So I don't believe I have a conflict but this, except for the hypocrisy that we operate under today. Councillor Potter, nothing to disclose? I don't believe I have a conflict. Mayor. Okay, good, thank you. Councillor Henshin. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Yes, supposedly so, being a primary producer, I actively hunt and control pigs on my place. Um, we had a very interesting conversation here on Monday in, in a, another source of eliminating wild animals, feral pigs. Thank you for the work done on this and the recommendations there. I certainly won't be supporting the pig snout bounty because of biosecurity and all our <coughs> rules and regulations in and around that. Uh, I think there's a lot of work that could be done, great work that could be done in that conversation we had on Monday. Yeah, I'm also an active member of the Iron Pot Wild Dog Trapping uh, Syndicate, which may be irrelevant to this, but in time, in future, it could be involved in it in some shape or form as well. So that's my declarable interest that um, I'm a very active uh, varmint in my own property, a controller of wild and feral dogs and pigs. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. So, Mr CEO, we've got all that uh, information now. So. We'll, uh, we'll move on to item, thank you councillors, we'll move on to item 12.1, memory transfer, sta transfer station, which is at 162, uh, and we'll go to our manager planning and environment. Thank you, Manager Brooks. Yeah, thank you, Mr Mayor, through you. Um, so this report's put up just in relation to um, what our waste collection team uh, confronted with, I guess, at some of these unsupervised uh, waste facilities, um, which has you know, been ongoing for quite a number of years um, and I suppose it's about bringing back the awareness to council around what they are confronted with, how probably the minority are, are treating some of these sites and um, it's about trying to um, model a, a pathway forward in which we can reduce the risk to council regarding um, some of these sites. So what we've identified is uh, Memorambi uh, transfer station. Um, because it's proximity to King Roy, it's easy to sort of, you know, um, get the camera vision and lock the gates and open the gates, etc. So um, we've identified that Memorambi, you know, uses a trial site for three months to uh, reinstate the op um, operational hours or, or a movement in inside and, and out of that facility. And um, yeah, so and hopefully it won't address all the concerns that uh, we are confronted with at some of these sites, but at least it's a start and trying to wrestle that control back over what's going on at these sites. So happy to take any questions, Mr. Mayor. Mm, thank you, Manager, and thank you for bringing your report forward. Um, okay, because we have a motion there. Yes, um, so let's let's just consider the motion. The committee recommended council that, one, introduce the following operate, operating hours at Memorambi Transfer Station, seven days a week from uh, 6.30 to 4. These operational hours be on a three-month trial. A report be brought back to council prior to the conclusion of the trial and a community awareness program of the new operational hours be implemented prior to the commencement of the trial. Do we have a mover? Councillor Schumacher, seconder. Councillor Potter, thank you. Speakers, Councillor Schumacher. Um, thank you, Mr Mayor. Uh, just a couple of questions. So I was reading through the report and the photographs. I was just wondering, do we currently track what it costs across our 17 different waste facilities um, for the contractor to respond to illegal dumping or act activities that actually require us outside of what we've budgeted for in our operation to go and respond to compact the skip bins or remove waste that's been dumped in inappropriately? That's my first question. Yes, through you, uh, Mr Mayor. Yes, um, and any costs associated with clean up or picking up you know, and removing illegal dumping is assigned back to that particular 
um, waste facility. So um, yeah, that gets incorporated into the operational costs. Yeah, thank you. Um, just like if, if it's possible after we do this trial to actually bring back some of those costs and what the actual cost would be if we do um, adopt this change in service. I was reading in the report that previously residents in the area had a key to access the area, um, but somebody had driven through the gates a number of years ago and so the gates weren't re reinstated at that point in time. Um, I know there's always a risk that people travelling through an area could dump, and I know that's come up before in particularly rural areas where we've got waste facilities and the neighbouring councils don't, so we have people who don't necessarily live in our region dumping waste um, in our facilities and not contributing to the cost, so um, contributing to sharing the cost. So I'm just really interested if we do um, this trial. I know I read in the report it says that we'd be using an existing resource to open and close the gates, but my I would be very interested in what the, the costs of actually resourcing this might be if, if we are to make a change, and I could see potentially it might actually be a cost saving if we are currently paying for costs um, to clean up, clean up waste not dumped properly. So I'm supportive of the trial. I definitely want to make sure as part of the trial that that community awareness um, process is undertaken and it's probably just my final question is just um, how will we be undertaking that to target the people around Memorambi? Um, I know we do a lot of media releases but is this something where we should consider a, a um, letterbox drop or something? That's my question to Manager Darrell. Yeah, uh, thanks for the question through you, Mr Mayor. Um, part of that uh, public awareness, I guess, of the trial is um, we're looking at putting call flute signs up at the facility and um, so we'll probably try and, if you know this motion gets approved, you know, we'll probably try and get them in and uh, uh, designed and, and printed before Christmas if we can um, and then we'll probably have, I'm anticipating by the time we do all that and the other comms, it'll be sort of probably 1st of Feb or something like that before we'd actually start the trial. That'll give people, you know, a month's notice of, of the trial. So, um, you know, with the frequencies that people visit the, the sites, you know, that probably is, is adequate in my view. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Councillor Duff. Um, just a question through you, Mr Mayor. Just, I, I noticed you put where possible the waste collection officers will open and close the gate as part of their current collection run. When it's not possible, what's the other option? Um, through you, Mr Mayor. Um, yes, we do have um, some um, employees who are prepared to go and, and open the, and, or shut the gates when we don't have the vehicle um, go, passing through Memorambi at around that you know, opening or closing time. So I think that just shows the, you know, the dedication that our people have to try and address this problem um, that um, they're confronted with at these sites. So, and obviously it's for short term. If we extend the trial or, or make it more permanent, well then we'll probably need to come up with a more, another solution for that, yep. So Manager, you could, you could, your team could assure Council that it would be opened and closed every day for the three month trial? Yeah. Yeah, okay. that's correct. I think yes. that's the question, wasn't it? Yeah, okay, very good. Further speakers? Oh, happy to go to the vote. Those in favour? Carried unanimously, thank you all. Thank you, um, Manager Brooks, for bringing forward that report. 13.1, Kingaroy Lions Park amenities upgrade and park redevelopment at 168. Now, I see that this one was laid on the table. Um, so, Council, we have the option of a procedural resolution that the Kingaroy Lions Park amenities be lifted from the table. Do we have a mover? Councillor Shoemaker. Mayor. Sorry, yes. Oh, yeah, lifted from. I'd like to move the alternative motion. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's a no. No, the, the, if, if I may. So it need, it'll need to be lifted. Uh, you actually moved and seconded at an ordinary meeting, so it carries it carries yeah. a fair degree of weight. Yeah. Um, so if you want to move the alternative, I didn't use foreshadowed in when we set the agenda up, but if the alternative motion is preferred, <laughs> on the original resolution needs to be voted down, basically. Oh, okay. Right, okay. So... <laughs> Um, okay, well, so the Kingaroy Lions Park amenities be lifted from the table. Do we have a mover? Procedural, yes, we have a mover. Councillor Jamaica, seconded Councillor Potter. So we'll go to the vote. Those in favour? 
carried unanimously. Thank you all. Um, so that motion, as Mr. CEO has indicated, has been moved and seconded. Moved by Councillor Potter, seconded Councillor Henshin, that King Reliance Park amenities is replaced with a new accessible and total inclusive amenity. An additional allocation of 190000 for the construction of a new amenity footpaths and PW car park be provided from building asset restricted cash, cash in 22-23. Okay, so that's the motion that we're now debating, Council. So, Mayor, yes. you resume, you're effectively resuming debate from where it stopped last time, but the, the counters yes. start again. But, yeah, so that's live, so that needs to be dealt with first. Yes, so that motion is live. We'll debate this particular motion uh, as we have it here now. Uh, speakers, Councillor Potter as the original mover. Um, Thank you. Yeah, Mr Mayor, so I'm actually not too sure of the rules here. Are we allowed to, do we have to vote on this particular motion or can we move at this stage to the alternative motion? Now that this motion is live, we need to vote on this motion, I believe, Mr. CEO. Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. For, sorry, Mr. CEO. The other alternative is, and it would it's effectively a vote, but if it's the will of the meeting to withdraw it, um, it can be withdrawn, but it just needs to be dealt with. Or if the meeting, I probably shouldn't um, advocate a case, but if the meeting thinks that that's the best resolution, it's dealt with and the other one lapses. Okay. So we can deal with it. Um, if the meeting wanted to move on to the alternative motion, then we could put this to the vote. Um, and you could therefore, that would then basically, um, this would then, this would basically then fall over. So, um, Councillor Schumacher. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just in speaking to the original motion, just wanted to acknowledge and thank um, Manager Leanne and her team, um, the team members did actually offer to meet with councillors at the toilet facilities and I know I did um, meet Councillor Erkins and Councillor Potter at the facilities and Tony Jakes actually walked us through the dilapidation report and explained it. So thank you very much for that. Um, I learned a lot through that experience. Um, look, ideally if we had the initial purpose of this funding and I was very supportive of... Um, using the Works for Queensland funding to try to do something about freshening up the amenities. And, um, you know, I really just want to acknowledge the amount of work that's gone in uh, to date. We now know we've got a very good idea in terms of, you know, the age of those amenities are quite old. And to meet current standards, particularly for people with disabilities, they will need significant changes made to the building. And, um, you know, at this point in time with the challenges Council faces from a financial point of view to remove money from, I'm, I'm apprehensive to remove money from our building asset restricted cash, just not knowing the many other things that we have that are broken, failing or need a more urgent. Um, so I'm comfortable with the decision to actually sweat the amenities, sweat that asset for a little bit longer. Um, also recognise that with the changes to the park, there are changes to usage and um, certainly I think into the future it would be ideal to be able to build a new amenities facility there. Um, I'm just mindful of at this point in time the many projects we're trying to manage and the challenges um, in delivering on that project when it is serving a purpose and delivering on a need in its current state. So I'm not supportive of this motion as it stands, um, but did want to acknowledge the work that's gone in. I think it's great that we now have that information and can make decisions about that facility moving forward. Okay, thank you, Councillor. Further speakers? Councillor Henshaw. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Could I just direct a question through you, Mr Mayor, to Manager Leanne. We've just experienced some fairly horrific um, maintenance issues in the toilets in Wandai. Um, in the event, in your opinion, of taking this out to the 23-24 program, we're not going to have any major disaster there where we have to bunt that toilet facility off, being a public facility, and we have one in Wandai that's bunted off for the next two or three months. Um, the question I dare ask, is that a possibility to happen there? Um, thank you, Councillor Henshin. I don't have a crystal ball, but um, we certainly um, have a, a very thorough building um, assessment team on staff. 
um, with Tony and, and Malcolm. They've had a really good look at this facility. Um, certainly uh, we could sweat it out, as, as Councillor Shoemaker mentioned, um, for, for a little bit longer. Structurally, the building will hold and be sound and we can, can continue to use it. The difficulty that we're going to have with this building going forward is that you're going to have a total inclusive park, footpaths, car park, playground equipment, picnic tables, barbecue, but you're not going to have um, a suitable amenities for the person to use. So that's our difficulty moving forward with this particular facility, as well as it being in poor condition, but more really around the um, usability of the actual toilet block for disability. So going forward, it's something that we need to, to look at um, addressing, but whether or not there's future, you know, other funding opportunities out there to actually make these sort of improvements to these facilities, because you've done a lot of hard work in getting the park up to standard, um, it would be nice to, to continue and make the facility um, suitable for, for disability access as well. But structurally um, and operationally, um, the amenities will continue um, at this stage. I have no concerns with that. Thank you, Mr Mayor. And I guess one my concern would be projected costs of $290,000 deferred till 23-24. How confident are we were going to come in with that costing? We are not confident. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Councillor Oakens. Um, through you, Mr Mayor, um, I'd also like to thank um, General Manager Leanne for coming down and my fellow councillors. I personally think that there is not a lot of work to make that more accessible for um, dis disabilities. The wall that's there, really, you wonder why they didn't put the door in there instead of making them go round the corner. You know, I think that could be um, done with a minimum of expense. I do understand that a nice new toilet block would be great. However, as has been explained to me on many occasions, we just don't have the money to do that. So, you know, I can't support this motion for that simple fact. It's quite usable. Councillor Duff. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I wasn't able to get to that um, particular meeting, but I did have a look at the toilets and um, I agree with what Councillor Erkins has said. And into the future, I'm just surprised it hasn't already happened, why we haven't got a um, disability car park there and, and just a path to the, just to the disabled toilets there would be, to me, a good start. Further speakers, otherwise Councillor Potter, um, we've had some speak, yeah, sorry, Councillor Jones. Yeah, sorry, Mr Mayor, I'm trying to get through to lunch and not say anything, but anyway, you've got to be a part of it. Haven't you? Um, just uh, say, can I, what we're discussing at the moment, have we voted down the original motion? Has that been taken so, off? So, so we're, we're discussing the original motion, which was right moved on. by Councillor Potter, yeah. and we'll go to Councillor Potter to speak uh, with for a right of reply, then we'll go to the vote yeah, on that. So that was what we were talking about—an extra, uh, well, two ninety plus one hundred and ninety. So that was that's four eighty. So yeah, I, yeah. So I'm, I'm quite happy not to support that at the minute, and we'll move on to obviously the alternative motion. That'll be the next one. I'll speak then. Thanks, mate. So, Councillor Potter, we've had councillors speak against the motion. You have the right of reply option. No, happy to go to the vote. Let's go to the vote. Uh, those in favour of the motion. Those against? Okay, the motion has been defeated. Um, it's been defeated unanimously. Thank you all. Okay, we've now got an alternative motion provided, committee. Would you like to have an open discussion around that? Okay, let's open up the floor to discussion. Councillors, uh, feel free to engage. Councillor Jones. Yeah, I'll go first and try and be brief, Mr Mayor. So, Councillor Henshin's alluded to it already, the 290,000, uh, Manager Peterson has already confirmed that uh, the likelihood of that being at 290 still in the 23-24 uh, year, as we all know, every project that we have done in the last 12, 18 months, two years has just out of control and steel contracts or quotes I know are usually good for 24 hours as, as we currently operate. Uh, so if we were to push that back, you're still going ahead to 
the motion, I'll, I just want to be correct in my own mind that you're still going to do the soft fall at 142. You're still going to do the shelters on the other side at uh, 15,000. I don't know that you're going to get, I don't know what shelters you're putting up and picnic benches uh, at 15,000. I don't know what, I don't know how or how you're going to create that. Is that a misprint? General Man uh, GM Peter or somebody? Yeah, through you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, so we actually already have the shelter, so it's just um, the slab and installing them. So we've already got the kits. Oh. Okay, so that's that's good. That's a good news story, Pete. Well done. <laughs> yeah, and uh, the playground redevelopment picnic shelter projects to be funded from the current, with the balance of funding source from the existing hundred. Um, so we're still going ahead with the playground redevelopment and all that sort of stuff and trying to push back the toilet amenities until the 23-24. Um, and I hear Councillor Erkin say, and I, I wasn't able to make that meeting and I sent my apology through, but so is there a possibility then to you, through you, Mayor, to the uh, manager and GM uh, in regards to the comments uh, from the councillors that were there in regards to bringing that facility up to standard as far as access for disability. Has that been looked at as an option of taking walls out or, or doing what the councillors have suggested? And is that a possibility to look into that and save money there? Um, yes, thank you, um, councillor. Tony has had a look at it. Um, he would have to do major structural change to that wall um, and, the, and the roof for the change to happen. Um, so yes, we probably could go away and do a detailed design on that. I think he's worried that once we go to that level, it's actually going to start costing us a lot of money, um, where we might be in a better position to actually um, decommission the entire building and start again, and then the whole lot is refreshed and renewed. Because it's not just that one room um, that is, yes, I understand what you're saying. It's just about providing um, accessibility to dis disabled accessibility. However, there's other concerns with some of the other, the other toilets and, and structure around the rest of the building. Um, so yes, happy, happy to take that on board. And we could probably do that as I just remind councillors, remember we are carrying out a review on all public amenities across the region at the moment to actually determine what are the most important public amenities going forward. Um, and that's, that's what's going to help inform our decision making of where we should be spending money in the future. So this, this particular project, um, you know, we'll look at it in 23-24 but we will also have all that information about all the other public amenities that you've got across the region. We, we will need to prioritise because we appreciate we just do not have the money. In saying that, we could pick that up, Councillor Jones, and, and have a look at that time, whether or not we could... Um, we would have to engage an engineer to actually start drawing up structural designs on how we're going to modify that building to actually make it compliant. And we probably don't have the money at the moment to do that if we're going to allocate all the money to the, the park and the softfall. So that's why we haven't gone down that path is because once we start using that money for the engineering costs and the design costs, it's taking money away from some of the other on-ground works that you want to do. the upgrade already that it's already had, what I think what we need to discuss is what's more important, having a facility, toilet facility and all that sort of stuff, or do we continue upgrading the, the, uh, the park to uh, continually draw more people there and then not, not have the facilities to cater for it or whatever. So I, I struggle with that alternative motion just on the fact that um, in regard, because we've got another one coming up straight after this one to discuss very similar situation so I just um, you know you, you're talking about items two and three on the motion whereas you're encouraging people to come there but when you get them there at the moment we don't have the facilities that are that meet legislation and safety requirements and all that sort of stuff so I think there's a conversation to be had around that what's the priorities yeah councillor Potter yeah thank you mr mayor I think there's um, another a few things here also with regards to the toilets um, 
the toilets that they're looking at putting in, I think, have the very similar to the ones we have at Memorial Park, if I'm correct. Um, but on a personal level, um, maybe we should be looking at down making less toilets there and maybe even putting an adult change table in with a hoist. I know they're very expensive, but we do not have one in the whole of the South Burnett. And wouldn't it be good if at the, you know, a park that we're already looking at with disabilities that we actually have an adult change table and a hoist? Because at the moment, an adult who needs to get changed, no matter how old they are, they're usually changing them on the floor. That's not good enough, guys. They're changing them on the floor. Wherever they are, we do not have one in anywhere in the South Burnett. And heartbreaking it is as a parent, if you're a parent of one of these, whether it's an adult or a, or a child that cannot fit on a change table, that's where you're doing it. Or in the back of your car. And, you know, there is just nothing there for them. So I would like to actually change the scope of this, maybe do less toilets and maybe doing the, the one... Um, a disability toilet, maybe doing just two toilets, male, female, whatever, um, and doing one toilet that actually has a change table with a hoist. And I think that that's probably, for me, that's a better way to go for us as a community if we are looking after our people with disabilities. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Erkins, I think you were next. I had you take your light off. Did you want to speak? Yeah. I did. Um, my, my understanding when we spoke to the guy from council down there, to make that door, to change that door, there's no structural, there's no structure, that wall is not a load-bearing wall and that would not be a big thing to actually make that easier. This is the disabled toilet that we're talking about, but I agree completely what you've, with what Janita said about there being a um, need for a, an adult change table, but I just wanted to verify that. I did specifically ask him whether there was any, whether that wall was load bearing and it's not. Sure, um, take that on board um, through you, Mr Mayor. I think also what Tony was also saying, once we make the, the doorway wide enough, the actual room itself is still not compliant. Um, so that's probably where I was referring to is just what other modifications we need to make to make that room fully compliant. Um, not just the doorway. So, yep, but take that on board. Thank you, Jane. Councillor Duff. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. I'm, um, yeah, like um, Councillor Jones, not supportive of the alternative motion. I think that we need, um, before we make a decision on these toilets, and I agree with what Councillor Potter said about a hoist, but when we're doing a review of all of the amenities across our region, we should consider which one would be the best to have that particular hoist. It may not necessarily be the one at Lions Park. It might be better to be at Memorial Park, for example. So I just think we need to get more information before we make a decision on putting the, the um, upgrade of this amenities into the 23-24 budget. So I'm not supportive of the motion. Thank you. Yeah, we haven't already got a motion yet. Um, but we're just trying to flip oh, the alternative motion, yeah. We're trying to work towards a motion um, for the discussions, yeah, open to discuss it. Councillor Shoemaker. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, I just wanted to check. Our next quarterly review, we're reviewing the whole Capital Works program across all assets, all services. Everyone's getting a thorough review. Have I got that? I'm right. Yes, I know we've talked to talked about it to death, but I just want to make sure. Um, I am in two frames of mind, and uh, I guess some of my questions are around. I do think to we've purchased the shelters and the picnic benches, and so. We've put the other part, the other side of the drain where those logs, I definitely want to see those logs removed. They, they need to go. Um, but we have, we've also identified that space as potentially an area for a dog park as well. I've got that right. Mm -hmm. So if we put these, I think if we've got structures sitting there that could be used, it doesn't make sense if they're bought for this purpose, they should be installed. If we put these in place, are we sort of confident that we could still create, if, if the decision was down the track, to create a dog park, that these would still add value to the space if we installed them now? Um, the answer to that is yes. Um, we have allowed for that when we are actually designing where the dog park was 
going to be proposed yeah. um, was making sure that the dog park was back a little bit um, behind those log, those current log um, um, shelters um, to still allow for these new shelters to be installed and a footpath to those new shelters and they would be then also complementary to the dog park so people could still have their dog in the park and may also use the shelter outside as well so that was the intent but the area in terms of fitting it all um, it does fit in our designs. Yeah fantastic I, I just think you know, if we've got those shelters there, I remember having that discussion in this chamber that we, were, we wanted to get rid of those old um, log shelters and replace them. So I would, I certainly think that's a good thing to do. I think the toilet amenities and after the, um, certainly the failure in Wondi, which nobody saw that coming, you know, um, I think... I think we really do need that, that full review of our amenities to understand where they're all at. And I'm very mindful that they're all being used for different things at the moment in terms of people who are homeless are also heavily relying on those facilities. So I think that's a smart thing to do. In terms of the inclusive playground um, option here, I know in the report there were three different options and I just wanted to confirm that I've read it right that we'd actually be... If this motion's proposing option one, which is only a, a small scale playground, it's not sort of everything that was desired. There were three options put forward. In terms of designing the playground, I remember the playground plan coming through. I just wondered who was actually involved in that. How how was the playground plan actually designed, scoped? Who who was involved in that process? Is my question, Manager Jolier. And are we confident in the scoping that's been done? Um, I w uh, thank you very much for your question. Um, the playground upgrade and the design that's part of that concept plan that council adopted um, was prior to me being manager of, of, of parks and facilities. So um, because council has adopted that design and that plan, I have taken that as a, that's your preferred, preferred playground. Um, and what we've done is just gone through and, and continued on a little bit of research and talking to some of the, the companies out there that actually supply total inclusive playground equipment and got some feedback on what's what some of the modern parks using um, down on the, you know, the Sunshine Coast just to make sure that some of the um, equipment that was proposed is is what other communities and other, other councils are utilising. And that's why we've sort of you know, stuck with the merry-go-round type idea. Um, we've moved away from the moulded hard plastic peanut sheet um, shaped seats um, because we felt that we've invested a fair bit into the, the shelters and the picnic tables and there was feedback on um, the idea of these like mini trampolines that kids jump on, but the trampolines also can take um, a child or a person in a wheelchair um, and their carers, so they can be on the trampoline um, at the same time. So that's where those ideas and that feedback has come from. We certainly haven't gone back to our community, to some of our disability groups, um, to just to see if they like the, the equipment idea. Um, the other thing, and exactly what you said before, playground equipment is all at different ages. Um, so you've got to, we've got to have a look at that. You can't provide um, playground equipment for kids at 16 years of age and also at two years of age. So we've really targeted the, the playground equipment at, um, under the age of eight years of age. Um, and that's why you're seeing some of that type of equipment and not some of the, the other sorts of things. Um, also the space is restricted as well. So if you're going to go into some of the other equipment for older children, we need a bigger amount of space. And this park doesn't cater for that. That needs to go to um, Kingaroy Memorial Park. And we've certainly done a lot of community um, consultation in that space and I think we're quite confident that that's where the community wants to move with that but um, certainly this is for children under the age of eight and definitely the equipment is for um, children with disabilities that could access this equipment. Yeah yeah thank you for the clarity. Um, at this point in time I guess I'm thinking Mr Mayor I would like to see those shelters installed. I'm not sure about allocating the $100,000 from the open spaces. I know there's been extensive consultation about Memorial Park. I know we took funding from Memorial Park to be able to do Tipperary Flat. Um, I know we've got to, 
I want to see the vision come together for Lions Park, but I do think we need to be mindful of the construction costs and the inflation costs and make sure that whatever we do here, we're actually able to, to cover the cost and deliver on the outcome. So I'd probably rather see us make this decision at the quarterly review when we review all projects, unless there's any reason why you would need us to push the button on this now. That's my last question, Manager Leanne. So, um, Mr CEO, sorry, just a couple of things. First of all, it is now 103. We probably need to wrap up by 150 at the latest because Councillor Erkins needs to attend a funeral and Councillor Potter, you need to go as well. Do we want to get a resolution forward or do we want to simply let this... We, we've dealt with the matter um, primarily. We don't have to proceed on the alternative motion, I don't believe. So we could set this aside or in fact basically just let it not proceed and consider it at a later time if Council wanted to do that or we could have a motion put forward today. But Manager Leanne, I'm probably keen to understand the implications of that. If we say we're going to leave this until the new year when we do the second quarter budget review and we don't make a decision on this until February, is that going to cause issues for you? Um, it's not going to cause any issues. Um, we're, we're just trying to get some decisions made so we can start um, ordering and, and preparing our capital works program and implementation for next year. That's all we're trying to really lock in. Which way do you want to go? Um, is it playground equipment? Is it bathroom renovations? There's only a small amount of funds there. So unfortunately, we just can't get the funds to do everything that you want. So that's why we've sort of tried to suggest one priority item, get that and get that kicked off by and finished by you know June next year. You've got to appreciate that a lot of this equipment, um, as you said before, the prices are continuing to rise and the availability is going to be our issue. If we could order it before Christmas, we could lock it in and have it here by March, you've implemented the project by June. But if we hold to February, um, for a lot of our Capital Works decisions, we are, are going to struggle just to you know, get that three months ordering in and probably most likely not deliver this project before the end of the financial year. So. Happy, happy to lay it on the table and wait to then, but I'm just um, just suggesting they're the time frames that are impacting us in the delivery in terms of offices, making sure the works get done. Councillor Erkins, we'll come back to Councillor Shoemaker. Councillor Erkins. Yes, yeah, Shoemaker. Okay. Can I move a motion that we install the tables and chairs that we've already got, and the rest of it we we look again. In, was it March? Motion that Council install the two shelters. You could probably just cut and paste item three, I think, Kimberly. Okay, and at the end, for $15,000, and reconsider the remaining items at the second quarter budget review in February 2023. Thank you, Councillor Erkins. Do we have a second? <laughs> Councillor Potter, second at that. Yeah. Speakers? Um, can I Councilor just Potter? ask a question through you, Mr Mayor, of Manager Leanne? Um, there's the talk about $80,000 funding source from the existing $100,000 works to Queensland. So we had originally applied, we had originally 100000 in that account for Lions Park. And We've got eighty thousand left. Is that correct? And when do we have to use that by? Thank you for the question. Um, yes, you have got eighty thousand dollars left in the Works for Queensland funds for Lions Park refurbishment, and you've got a further hundred thousand dollars in your regional public amenities for Lions Park. So you had two little buckets of money left there. Um, my understanding: the grant has to be acquitted and finalised by June two thousand and twenty-four. Thank you, Manager. Okay, Councillor Erkins, anything further to your motion? Further speakers? Shall we, Councillor Jones? Yeah, I want to get the last <laughs> one. The 180,000, okay, so just for my own clarity, when we get to the discussions in the new year for the budget review, the existing funding that you have there now, you said it was $290,000 for the amenities upgrade. We needed an extra 190,000 
on top of that, or did that include up to the 290? Just you don't have the 290 at all. So we've got to find that. So 180 will still not cut it. We still need more to do that. Okay, thank you. Yep. Anything further, councillors? No? Okay. I think we're ready to go to the vote. Those in favour? Carry unanimously. Thank you all. Um, councillors, it's 1.08. I would suggest we need to wrap up for lunch by 1.15. Um, we can either wrap up for lunch now or we can proceed to the next item. You want to wrap up now? Okay. All right. Move a procedural motion that we adjourn for lunch. Do we have a second? No, Councillor Shoemaker got in before Councillor Anshin. Thank you. Uh, yes? Yeah. Oh. Yes. All oh, right. Okay. So, councillors, um, we have two councillors that need to leave. I just need. I need to go to the bathroom. Bathroom, councillor. I can come back. We I might have to call you back after lunch, manager. Okay. Yep. Yeah, let's go to the vote. Those in favour, we break for lunch. Carry you nervously. Sorry. And do we have a seconder? Councillor Shoemaker, thank you. Those in favour, carry unanimously. Thank you all. We just noted that council, councillors Potter and Erkins uh, have left the meeting because they had other pressing matters to attend to. So we're now up to 13.2. Yes, thank you, Mr CEO. 13.2. Mergen PCYC toilet refurbishment uh, at 188. Thank you, Manager Peterson. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I'm just presenting a report for council consideration today. We have done a full costing on the Mergen PCY, PCYC toilets. Um, this is for an upgrade in the, in the facility. Currently, um, we have got a number of showers, um, cubicles out of action, and we've got them actually closed at the moment. So we have got some damage in the pipework that's actually in the um, walls itself. Now, those pipeworks, um, the only way you can access them is to actually um, remove a whole heap of the, um, the wall, um, which is Besser brick wall. So it's a fair bit of work to get to the repair works. Um, the other issue is a lot of the tiles are falling off um, and um, also they're non-compliant toilets. With the improvements that PCYC have made to their operations at this facility, there's now a 24-7 our gym um, that the community can access. Um, there's a number of programs that are running. We've also done the upgrades to the squash courts. Um, there's boxing and all sorts of things that happen at this facility. And also it's used for the, the music muster, the Mergen show, um, and a number of other events. So the amenities are a, a very important component of this building and the function it provides to um, all the groups and users. So going forward, um, we would be keen to, to look at making these improvements. However, um, we decided to send the, the actual designs away to get a quantity survey so we could get a, a, you know, a, good, a good costing for council's consideration. Um, the costing has come back at 660000 and unfortunately we have a $380,000 allocation in the Works for Queensland budget. So unfortunately, we are unable to deliver this project within that, within that budget. So we've brought it back to council for consideration. Um, obviously, we can't progress with not having the full allocation of budget. Uh, we're suggesting maybe we will need to hold on this project and look at all, uh, other alternative funding allocation or other funding sources um, and see also whether or not Merg and PCYC may be able to partner with council and, and look at how we may be able to obtain some other funding. Um, our suggestion is based on our information that we've previously given council on the urgency to, to do some works at the Mergen Caravan Park, the free 24-hour stopover park in Mergen. Um, that facility there is in, in um, urgent, uh, needs urgent attention to address the issues that we have there. So um, we already have $100,000 in the capital works budget to start designs on that project that was going to commence after Christmas. Um, our suggestion is we either hold this 380,000 or we allocate this 380,000 from the Works for Queensland to that Mergen Caravan Park 
amenities. Um, so that's the report for consideration. You'll see in the report there the full costing and you'll see um, the, the designs that we've prepared for PCYC. Thank you, Manager, for all the work you've done in bringing that to the council. Yeah, Can Councillor I move Jay. A, an amendment to the recommendation, Mr. Mayor? Yes, yes, sir. Certainly, can Councillor I, Jones. Can I move a motion or recommendation that we hold that 380 and see what, uh, excuse me, see what um, we can source in funding and what the manager has said there? I, I believe that that uh, PCYC toilet facility needs to be done. I think it's a high priority. I, I don't want to. I wouldn't like to see that the money get allocated to the Mergen, any other amenity. I know there's other issues there, as the manager has just highlighted, but I'd like to leave the money or hold the money until the second quarter review or something like that or see, source all other avenues to see that because I support this. I think that Mergen PCYC toilets need to be done. So yeah. how we get there across the line, I don't know. Um, so I guess I'll look for a bit of guidance. Um, my recommendation would be to um, hold the 380 to further investigate other funding options. Yep. Um, yes, yeah, certainly. Um just to see how we could put that in. In terms of the total cost being 660, I mean, that, that's that's probably a fairly robust figure, isn't it? Because we had a quantity surveyor prepare that and it does factor in the 20% con contingency. Um, if we hold the 380, we'd then be looking for another 280, wouldn't we then, manager? Yeah, yeah. Um, 380, yeah. 280. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So we might. Yeah. I think. Could we just? We might. Let's. Can we have an open discussion, and then we can come back to you, Councillor Jones. For we might be able to work together to come up with a motion that everyone's comfortable with. Councillor Shoemaker. Yeah. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, certainly agree. Um, the PCYC bathrooms are quite outdated, and it is wonderful to see a new lease of life on that facility. I do equally understand the challenges we've got with the Mergen Caravan um, Park. Uh, toilet facilities that are also in desperate need of, of refurbishment. Um, I'm wondering with this uh, 380 and with the work that you've done, uh, Manager Leanne, um, to cost the project in the current environment, uh, is there an opportunity to stage, stage the works in any which way? I would, I would not um, consider that as an option um, because we're, we've got to totally demolish the bathroom. It's, it's a bit difficult to hold three or four toilets and demolish the rest and make it happen. And then are we just going to do the females and not start on the males? Um, and, and our priority really is to, depending on how the builder you know, goes about the build, um, is really getting those unisex toilets in, which is also um, disability toilets. My first suggestion would be no, we would be keen to do the lot. Um, and also, being a double-storey building, we would be looking at making sure that other toilets in that facility is utilised, um, why these works are carried out and all the structural supports are put in place while we're doing those works. I think... Um, Initially, I would suggest that that could actually be of greater cost to us by staging it rather than doing it all at once. And just um, with the toilet facilities, you mentioned the the other toilet. So I was just trying to figure out, because there's the toilets upstairs and then is there an toilets downstairs? So we're only proposing the 660s only for one set of toilets. And they're the ones upstairs. Have I got that right? Um, sorry. Yep. So there's probably three areas within this facility yes. that has amenities. Yes. Um, on the on the ground floor, this is the the toilet block that is closest to the gym, closest to the stadium, closest to the front doors and the office. Um, it has showers and toilets currently. That's the one that we're proposing that we um, upgrade. Then you go through a gate, and then there's a series of another set of toilets, which are showers and toilets. Um, they probably only get used now in an emergency when we open it as an evacuation centre and we need more showers and more toilets. So that part of the facility um, doesn't get utilised a lot and probably also for the shows and the music muster. Then there's a set of toilets, um, toilets only, upstairs. 
Um, so the boxing classes and some of the squash would access those toilets upstairs. So when we do these works, um, there are another set of toilets on the ground floor that people could access Accurate. while these works occurred. Yeah, thank you. It's a bit of a rabbit warren in there. Um, yes, I'm I'm not sure to do what to do with this one. It's another one. I know it's such an important project and, you know, they're over 40 years old. Um, but I sort of come back to the opportunity to review with the third quarter review because I feel like there are so many projects in this exact same boat and if we if we keep making decisions to take funding from one, allocate to another, I'm not sure what the big picture here is. You know, we set a plan to deliver on all these projects for our community. We're now chopping and changing them every every meeting we're doing this. And I know it's the environment that we're in, but I guess it's difficult to know if this is the right decision, if there are more pending priorities in that list of projects that need to be considered. So. We've got till 2024 for Works for Queensland. We still have to determine LRCI funding and we're also going to have to lay out a 23-24 Capital Works project uh, budget. Um, I'm sort of thinking sometimes we have to go a bit slow to go fast and to make really reasonable decisions in a really difficult construction environment at the moment. So I'm probably quite happy to, to wait until we can do a proper review of everything with the quarterly review. Yeah. Councillor Henshin. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr Mayor. <clears throat> I actually visited those facilities on the Mergen uh, most of the weekend and it was disappointing to see that when we were there some 12 months ago, certainly nothing's improved in them. Um, and then reading the report, we have pipe work located in the walls, that's major. And correct me if I'm wrong, but those shower facilities there certainly wouldn't be compliant today like they are in some of our swimming pools where it's multiple access for everybody in one one area, which is unacceptable today. There's a lot of work to do in that space, and I'd like, as Councillor Jones and Duff has alluded to, yeah, I'd like to see this done. It's a wonderful facility, and we'll only get better utilised in the event of trying to get this done. Again, my fear, we, we keep holding things over, and it states there, 10% and 30%. Yeah, it frightens me that when we do this and we look back and say, oh, well, it was $380,000 and $660,000 and we go to do it in June next year or, or whenever it may be and it's 860000 So that's my concern with a lot of this. Yeah. Um, just uh, before we go any further, Councillor Jones has... Um, Mr CEO has just put together something, Councillor Jones's recommendation. Um, just have a look at that. That the council maintain the current works for Queensland budget of three hundred and eighty thousand dollars for the Mergen PCYC toilets, and investigate alternative funding options of two hundred and eighty thousand dollars to allow full completion of the project. And this matter be considered for the second quarter review in February twenty three. So you, that's what you are. That's what you are going for, Councillor Jones. Yeah. Okay. So Councillor Jones has moved that. Do we have a seconder? Councillor Duff, yep, yeah, okay, have a second. Um, further speakers, Councillor Jones, any further speakers on that? Councillor Duff? A question to, um, to Manager Leanne. Just for, with the 48-hour stopover, if we did what um, has been suggested in this motion, there'd be no money to do that 48-hour stopover toilet because you haven't got enough to complete that. How urgent is that and what happens if we don't do that particular amenity block? Um, thanks, Councillor, for the question. Yes, certainly um, we would not have the money um, to continue on with the build of Mergen. We've never had them uh, for the Mergen 48-hour um, stopover. We haven't had that allocation anyway. We've really only got the $100,000 in this capex to commence the design. So we are keen to get the design done and fully costed and then we would you know, bring that back for Council's consideration um, through the budget process for 23-24. Um, just our observations of you know, working through all the amenities and we have had a lot of reports in here over the last three months with public amenities. Um, the Mergen 48-hour stopover point is, is a high priority amenities block for upgrades. Um, but we will continue to manage it through the next, you know, six to 12 months if need be, um, where we are, you know, doing additional cleaning and um, breakage repairs and, you know, tree root removal from the pipework. And we're doing a number of things down there that's best we can to try to keep it open. 
Um, but long term, um, it will need a complete removal and upgrade. Hey, yeah, thank you, Manager. Uh, further speakers? Councillor Jones to close. You happy to go to the vote? Okay, we'll, we'll go to the vote. Those in favour, carry unanimously. Thank you all. Okay, we'll move on to 14.1, uh, which is the Tourism, Big Sport and Recreation and Commercial Enterprises Portfolio Report. Now, Councillor Erkins isn't here. It's a 214. Um, I'll move that that be taken, that that be accepted as read. Do we have a second, Councillor Jones? Uh, those, any, any questions, councillors? Those in favour? Carry unanimously. Thank you all. Um, okay, 15.1 is the Community Lifestyle Operational Update at 217. And we've all had a chance to read that. Uh, councillors, any issues to raise before we move that, push that one through? Okay. So we've got the recommendation there that, um, that the report, get to the right page, uh, that the community lifestyle operation update be received for information. Do we have a mover? Councillor Duff, thanks. Uh, Second, Councillor Henshin. Uh, to the vote, those in favour? Carry unanimously. Thank you all. Okay, 16.1, Q Rider application for funding for Kulabanya Sayyad's Capital Works at 2.24. Uh, should we go to you, Manager Point? Is this yours? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. So this is a grant opportunity that's come up. Um, that's a, it's essentially a state DAF money that's being administered by Q Rider. Um, it's open to um, all commercial uh, businesses, so for-profit businesses as well as local government. Um, it requires a 50% co-contribution. It is a little bit of a funny one in the fact that we can't use it on existing infrastructure, so we can't use it for more investment in renewing yards, things like that. It is very much focused around um, rural supply chains and improving um, basically um, rural economies and employing more people. Um, so it'll be important if we're successful in the expressions of interest to to show that in the application. And so that's why the projects that I've sort of listed as a suggestion um, are a little bit sort of out of the box, just trying to meet that those grant guidelines. Um, so it is only an expressions of interest process. It does close, doesn't close until next year, but given our timing with the Christmas shutdown and no standing committee in January, I um, just thought I would bring that forward for council's consideration. Thank you, Manager. 30 January, we'll need to get you an answer on this in December, won't we, in the December ordinary. Um, okay, well, thank you very much. So we have the recommendation there that we submit an EOI to round five of this fund for $200,000 and that Council co-contribute 50%, which would be $100,000, I guess, uh, should we be successful in the 23-24 Capital Works budget. Do we have a mover? Councillor Duff, second to Councillor Shoemaker. Speakers? Councillor Duff. Thank you, Mr Mayor. We discussed this yesterday with the working group and they... Um, was supportive of the um, of these recommendations. I know the FPOS would be well received by the users, and um, obviously additional water tanks, electronic signage, the hay and workshop shed. So that all those projects were were very they were supported by the um, the use the users of the facility at that working group meeting yesterday. Thank you, Councillor. Further speakers? No, everyone comfortable? Councillor Henshin. Mr. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you, just some clarity on that. Like, co-contribution of fifty percent of the total project costs. So is that we have total project costs of two hundred thousand dollars. So is that a hundred thousand dollars from council put input, not two hundred thousand dollars on on top of that? Like we have installation of the four articles listed there. So is that? Council contribution of 100,000 or is that contribution of 200,000? Through, through you, Mr Mayor. Um, I've, I've put forward a recommendation that our total project cost of $200,000, meaning Council would be required to contribute $100,000. The grant guidelines do, do say that we can apply up to $200,000, but um, I was just being realistic, to be quite honest, okay. um, about yeah. um, what, I, what I thought Council would be able to contribute and also what what projects would fit that criteria because um, it is a little bit narrow. So there's no, no point suggesting something. I appreciate that and no. good work because, um, yeah, just looking at a hay and a workshop shed, if it was $100,000 and we contributed 50, or well, if we were contributing another 100, it'd be one hell of a hay shed, a $200,000 hay shed. So thank you. 
Thank you, Councillor. Uh, if there's no further speakers, we'll go to the vote. Those in favour? Carry unanimously. Thank you all. Uh, I'd like to now welcome Councillor Shoemaker to present her Regional Development Development Services Community and Social Housing Portfolio Report. Welcome, Councillor Shoemaker. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr Mayor. I'm happy to table the report as read um, and just acknowledge <coughs> the, the team who have um, provided the information here today. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Councillor. Do we have a seconder? Councillor Jones, thank you. F speakers? To the vote, those in favour? Carry unanimously, thank you all. Uh, we're up to now 18.1, South Bernard Agricultural Strategy at 229. Recommendation is that the committee recommend to council that the draft South Bernard Agricultural Strategy 22 to 27 be adopted. Do we have a mover? Councillor Duff, seconded Councillor Henshin. Speakers? Councillor Duff? Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. I, I know that um, well, you know, I've done a lot of work on this and um, Everybody's had their eyes over it on the Boido board, and I think it's it's already been through this um, council chamber. There was a, a PowerPoint presentation, so um, I think it ticks all the boxes and keen to support it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Councillor. Mr. Zia, would we be able to write, once this is adopted, um, at the appropriate time, could we send a nice letter to Boido, um, particularly to the CEO, um, Christy Ward, who I know has led this project with great enthusiasm, to thank them for the work they've done on behalf of our region? Yeah, thank you. That'd be great. Uh, any further speakers? No? Go to the vote. Those in favour? Carry unanimously. Thank you all. Okay, 19.1, uh, Planning and Land Management Operational Update at 267. We have it there, Council uh, Committee, to read. Um, it is presented uh, to be accepted. I'll just get to the right page. Okay. Right, okay, so the recommendation is that the Planning and Land Management Operational Update be received for information. Do we have a mover? Councillor Duff, thank you. Second, Councillor Henshin. Speakers? Councillor Schumacher. Um, just a question, just on page 268, LL Temp Home 2. I just wasn't sure what that, what is an LL Temp Home? I think that's new on here. Yeah, I'd probably just, uh, through you, Mr Mayor, just um, yeah, take that on board. M might be local law, temp home, tem temporary, temporary home permit. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Manager. If there's no further speakers, we'll go to the vote. Those in favour? Carry unanimously. Thank you all. Uh, 19.2, Delegated Authority Reports uh, for the month of November at 2.70. Recommendation is that uh, the Delegated Authority Report be received. Do we have a mover? Councillor Jones, seconder. Councillor Henshin, thank you. Uh, speakers to the vote. Those in favour? Carry unanimously. Thank you all. 19.3, uh, list of correspondence pending completion of assessment report. That is at 481. And the recommendation is that the list of correspondence pending completion of assessment report be received. Do we have a mover? Councillor Henshin, thank you. Seconded, Councillor Jones. Speakers to the vote. Those in favour? Carry unanimously. Thank you all. Uh, Council, we now move to item 20 on the agenda, and the recommendation is that Council considers the confidential reports listed below in a meeting closed to the public in accordance with section 254J of the Local Government Regulation 2012, 20.1 Financial Hardship Rates Application, assessment number as stated under subsection D of the Local Government Regulation, and 20.2, request for waiver of rates, Mergen Pastoral Agricultural and Horticultural Society under subsection D of the Local Government Regulation. Do we have a mover? Councillor Schumacher, thank you. Seconder? Councillor Henshin, thank you. Um, speakers, to the vote, those in favour? Carry unanimously, thank you. We'll now close, go into closed. One, where we have a recommendation that which is presented uh, committee on page four of the confidential agenda. Uh, items one to nine outline that the committee recommend to council that they agree to uh, the payment arrangement as outlined, page four, one to nine, as presented. Do we have a mover? Councillor Jones, second to Councillor Henshin. Any speakers to the vote? Carry unanimously, thank you all. 20.2. We have a recommendation there 
uh, that the committee recommend to council that rates charges to the value of $1,261.92 for the period of 1 July 2022 to 31 December 2022 is waived for the Mergen Pastoral Agricultural and Horticultural Society Incorporated. Do we have a mover? Councillor Shoemaker, seconded Councillor Henshin. Speakers to the vote, those in favour, carried unanimously. Thank you all. That now brings um, the uh, meeting to a close. Um, thank you everybody for your attendance and have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you.